Correct. So technical analysis. This is a paper I added, you know, a few years ago. Oh yeah. I'm used to everything just working. Should it should sense what I'm doing? Just automatically. Where's the artificial intelligence? <coughs> I will say I heard another um, one of those business podcasts, business breakdowns on uh, Fresh, Hello Fresh, and boy, it was really really good. Um, I might get into that in a future class um, when I'm talking about portfolio. Um, I, I don't know how many of those y'all have watched, but the ones where they have either the CEO or the founder as the interviewee, they're so good, and they had the founder of this firm talking, and oh, it was quite excellent. So I encourage you to listen to that one. He did a good job of talking about margins. And what I really like is what well, is interesting on the operating leverage. They don't have much operating leverage. So I don't know how he was talking about that being an advantage. But as they grow, y'all know HelloFresh? Never heard of this firm? I would have thought, no way they're going to succeed. Uh, Blue Abram hasn't really succeeded. Um, but as an investor listening to him, I'm trying to get so what I'm doing as an investor listening first, I'm trying to figure out their numbers. So they're not real profitable, but could they become profitable? It's a fairly difficult business to run, very complex. So it's, he was very value chain. He must have read Porter's value chain. He was a very value chain kind of person, but he's talking about every step of the process. So they got to get the raw materials. That's about 30%, 35% of their, of their revenues. They got to source that. And so the guy interviewing him says, what's the difference between that and say, uh, he didn't say HEB, but HEB, it's a grocery store. He says, well, we source about 300 items. Grocery stores source about 50,000 items. Makes it much easier for us. It's a lot easier to work at 350,000. You can get much better pricing. Um, maybe you only need pineapples four times a year. So you can make sure you have those show up. Uh, what I thought was really interesting on him, because I'm doing the math, okay, 35%, that means, sounds like you're telling me if I go to HEB and do it myself, yours is going to cost three times more. But as he explained it, that's not true. Just because their raw materials is 35 doesn't mean I'm going to, that's what I'm going to pay at, at HEB. Obviously, he's paying wholesale, so that's, you know, much cheaper. He's doing fewer items, so he's got some buying power. But then he talked about waste. He compared the waste of a grocery store in his, I don't know if y'all, can y'all guess the difference? What do you think a grocery store's waste on produce is? Can you all work for a grocery store? 30%. 30%, yeah, 30%. That's a high waste. Why is it? Well, because you can't have three bananas sitting on the shelf. You have to have 50 bananas sitting on the shelf, which means 30% of them are gonna go bad. Uh, I was talking to people in Costa Rica that grow our bananas and they're like, you Americans are so picky. This banana is perfectly fine, but y'all won't eat it. It has a little bitty mark right there. There's not, that mark has nothing to do with the taste of the banana or the quality of it, but you won't buy it. Yeah, there's a company that specializes in ugly fruit. Oh, is there? The stores that have to throw away all the misshaped fruit because we yeah. don't buy it. Yeah. There's companies that sell those ugly apples to people that are not Yeah. Yeah, they think we're ridiculous and it's a perfectly fine banana. You just don't like this little thing on it. But 30%, their waste is 1%, but they're already got a huge advantage for them versus um, grocery stores. And then they got fulfillment. Well, part of the fulfillment is they're saving the customer time. So you got to put that in the equation. So when I look at that, I would want to actually sit down and figure out, let me buy some of their meals, see if they're any good. And yeah, I don't know if you've ever tried them. Are their meals any good? So I would try it, see if it's any good. See how much time it takes me, how much convenience. You still got to mix everything together, which to me kind of bothers me. Um, but then try to figure out how much that would cost me if I did it myself at HEB, what's the difference, those kind of things. Uh, but that's the way I think about a business. But what I really loved what he talked about was he asked, the interviewer asked him, why did you succeed in Blue Apron, didn't he? He refused to answer that question, but he answered it in a kind of a back way. He said, this is an extremely complicated business a lot of moving parts. He says, you better be a star athlete in every single one of those buckets or you're not gonna succeed. And he compared, I think he was talking about Blue Apron, he didn't specifically said, but he said, 
Some firms are these star athletes that have pulled the muscle. And you can be a, a Bolt, what's his first name? Usain. Usain Bolt. How, how would he perform if he pulled the muscle? He wouldn't be all that good, would he? And that's what he's saying. That's what, so he's kind of implying Blue Apron pulled the muscle somewhere. And you cannot be weak anywhere in that process when, that, when the process is that complex. So I love hearing CEOs like that. They love their business. They understand their business. They understand where things can go wrong. They're constantly paranoid, constantly looking at the business. So I like the management, whether that business can make money or not. It's, I don't like the fact that 70% of their costs are, are variable costs, which means as they grow, and they can grow really fast, you know, COVID was a huge advantage. He asked the question, well, you got all this business with COVID, but that's going to go away. And he says, well, no. These are people who suddenly knew nothing about us that are buying five meals a week, and now they're going to buy two meals a week. We're fine with that. We can live with that. They wouldn't have been customers at all. And now they're going to be buying, you know, two meals a week from them. So that's pretty good. So I'm tempted, you know, try it out and see, but I would, I would want to understand it from the customer standpoint. Is this something that really the customer would like? And then the economic mode, what's the economic mode? So he's saying the economic mode is we're absolutely best on every single step of this process. There's nothing we're weak on. Well, that's a hard thing to say is your economic mode. Um, because a competitor can obviously be exactly the same on that. But it's, it's interesting. Um, he did say the average American family has seven meals that they rotate constantly. That seemed really low to me. I added up mine. I came up with 12 for me that I rotated around. Um, so I thought, how could I be higher than the average American? But I guess since I'm retired, I have more time than a cook one more. But, um, but seven meals, like it's kind of boring. So I guess it is meatloaf Monday and pork chop Tuesday kind of thing for most families. And so that's that was his niche. He said he really wasn't competing against restaurants. He really wasn't competing against uh, grocery stores. You know, wanna, you want to guess what he said his biggest competitor was? Yes, CPG, what is CPG? Consumer packaged goods, so that's what he's saying. So why doesn't HEB do what he's doing? Couldn't HEB have prepared meals you come pick up? Everything's already sorted. He said they can't because they don't have the technology. We know what people are gonna order. We order in advance. HEB doesn't have the volume. You can't do seven of these. <laughs> You got to do 20 million of these. So he's saying this is an AI thing. This is a data business. And if HEB doesn't have the data, they're not going to succeed. They can do, they do a little bit, right? They do some of those kind of things, but they can't make a major business because they don't have the data. They don't have the volume to be able to handle it. So really smart guy. I love, I love hearing businesses like that. It gets me interested as an investor. It doesn't get me to invest until I've gone through all the math and make sure it works for the consumer and works for the business. And they've got something another competitor can't, can't copy that there's an interest. I encourage y'all to listen to that one. I think he did a really good job. All right, so let's talk technical analysis. I'll give you the, the background on it so you can really understand if this comes up in an interview, you know, how are you gonna address technical analysis? Um, most investors use it in some way. Most don't like to admit that they use it. Your college student, you're supposed to say, no, we know it doesn't work, and you're supposed to just throw it out is, is um, kind of hocus pocus kind of stuff. But it's used a lot in business. So what do you do with something where academia says it's, it's a waste, don't do it, and the practitioners use it all the time? Well, you've got you to gotta, you gotta address it. Um, so technical analysis, unlike relative value analysis, relative value analysis looks at historical information but it's really looking at, you know, how something trades versus its fundamentals. Technical analysis is looking really at past stock prices. It can look at volumes, but mainly looking at stock prices. Um, you might say technical analysis assumes fund fundamental analysis doesn't work, but that's not what they're saying. Technical analysis says fundamental analysis works way too good. Bottom line on technical analysis is Fundamental analysis is so, so good. You can really trust that the people investing know what they're doing and doing the right kind of things. What you can't trust, and this is really the key, is demand and supply. 
So funnel analysis is a great job. The problem is the supply and demand is not always in balance. And technical analysis tells you how those forces are in play. Who's in charge? Who's getting back in charge? So it's a supply and demand kind of thing. So they're saying fundamental analysis is working. It's just that there's a battle between the buyers and the sellers. They're working out. There's this battle. There's people who think the fundamentals are telling you bad stuff. People who think the fundamentals are telling you good stuff. They're arm wrestling. Some are waiting. Some are coming in. Some are some have a price that they're going to jump on. We're waiting for all this supply and demand to go into the system. And once it fully goes in the system, everything, the prices will reflect the fundamentals. But until we get there, the prices are going to do these patterns. They're going to tell us these, these interplays. Um, so what does academia tell us? So y'all have all had this, right? The efficient market hypothesis. I remember a doctor, I love what Dr. Lowe said about this. He heard some PhD students talking about their research and they're worried that the results might contradict the EMH. And they said, well, we'll fix that when that, if that comes up. And Dr. Lowe said he yelled over after him and said, I'm glad you're keeping an open mind in your research because they pretty much said, hey, if we contradict the EMH, we'll fix our research to match it. And he's like, well, what if EMH is wrong? And Dr. Lowe is someone who uh, challenged the random walk down Wall Street. He talks about that in one of his books. Made a presentation saying stocks are not in a random walk. And when he presented that, the guy after him came up and said, you obviously have an error in your math, so we forgive you, go fix it. And then that guy went and did the same thing Dr. Lowe did and discovered Dr. Lowe was right. He had an issue in apology. Um, so I'm going to show you Dr. Lowe. He has a lot to say here, but Eugene Fama, you can probably find him. He's one of those people that you probably could find on YouTube. Eugene Fama. I think he does. I've seen him. I don't think his name is a three in it. Um, boy, he's not that young. I don't know who that is. When he, when he was young. Okay. But I would listen. He's he's interesting. He's getting up there in age now. He's uh, I think he is a Nobel Prize winner. Um, yeah, I mean that's that is he. But boy, that's got to be like thirty years ago. Um, so he's famous. He's well known. He's highly respected. Uh, he he was the the professor for people like. Uh, Cliff Asnes and, uh, and then some others, you know, he's, he's had a lot of influence. He's actually working for a hedge fund that relies on behavioral finance and people tease him. I said, you know, you, you don't believe markets are inefficient and yet you have this hedge funds that's trying to beat market. He says, no, we're not trying to beat the markets. We just want to be paid for our risk and we know how to measure it. And so he, he doesn't even admit working for a hedge fund that he's trying to beat markets. He just, He's taking advantage of risks that pay and he thinks they pay well and he's gonna do it. So um, interesting person. Um, so you could definitely definitely uh, watch his YouTubes, learn a lot of stuff. But he's the one that tested technical analysis and essentially he says it does not work. It was part of his weak form tests. I think the most convincing thing he did to me was he created random charts just complete randomness. I don't know how he did it in the 70s. It seems kind of, I don't know how they did anything in the 70s before computers, but he took these random charts and he took them to technical analysts and the technical analysts couldn't tell the difference between an actual stock chart and a completely random one. So if you can't tell the difference between the two, then how do you say you're seeing patterns, <laughs> right? If there's patterns there, you should be able to say, hey, that one's a random, this one's a pattern, but they could not tell the difference between the two. So that to me is pretty, pretty convincing. Uh, but he said technical analysis should not be used. It's a waste of time. And yet a lot of people do. There's been several studies. I don't know how many have been since this, but um, the, the textbook I got this from 58% 58 showed positive results. 24% showed it actually hurts you. And then the rest show there is no pattern. Um, so technical analysis does not assume markets are inefficient technical analysis. I mean, it's amazing. Technical analysis says markets are efficient, very efficient, informationally efficient, which means they process information very, very well. What's not efficient is the traders and how they interact and get into the market. 
there's these these waves that come in different times. So technical traders assume all information is price. So the only thing you don't know is supply and demand and the timing of that. So the valuation and plus your notices on paper six, aren't you? Valuation is really difficult. You know, you're getting valuations that are much lower than the current stock price or much higher than the current stock price. You tweak one thing and what happens? You get a radically different number. Uh, you know, are you that precise that you, you know, I thought the growth was going to be five and a half percent. Well, I'm going to use 525. And now I've got a better number. Well, if you forecast five and a half percent over the next seven years and it comes out to be 525, I'm going to say that's a really good forecast. And yet you're going to get a radically different price today with that slight change. So the valuation process itself, and I've heard this in articles, markets are ignoring fundamentals. I've seen that as title. So how do you know? And fundamentals are as wide as a Grand Canyon. How do you know markets are ignoring fundamentals? So, and, and they, they say these articles as if we know exactly what these stocks are worth. You know, these, these market, these Wall Street people, they know exactly what Walmart's worth. And if it moves off one penny from that, they're trading. No, they don't. They have no clue what Walmart's worth. It's within a pretty wide range. And so that's the other thing is fundamentals are so, so uncertain. They're so wide. Um, and so they say fundamentals first, the market is very quick with information. They understand the information. They do it really well. But even when you know this information really, really well, your valuations are still extremely wide. Um, and so fundamental analysis is less valuable than watching those supply and demand imbalances. Um, they contend, they contend that, fun, that uh, fundamental analysis is a waste of time because there's so much uncertainty in it. Um, the art of technical analysis is identifying trends that change, try to find them early in the stage Without, a, without identifying what looks like a trend, which is really just noise. So it's finding a trend, but distinguishing it from noise and to maintain your position until the weighted evidence indicates that the trend has reversed. So the question is, are you trying to get on the trend early, which means you're gonna have a lot of false indicators, you can make a lot of mistakes. Or do you wait until the trend is sure and then you may miss the first 15% of that trend? Which of those are you gonna do? We use technical analysis at USAA. I was kind of wishy-washy on it. Um, our CEO was an advocate for technical analysis and my peers were making fun of me because I had to use technical analysis because of our CEO. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, he was like, draw it by hand and look at it. And we did that. And he said, here's our buy point 500. And I said, well, can I go back and do this with least squared so we get a better trend line? So I did that and I got a number like 300. I go back and say, your 500 is really 300. And he was like, no, I like my 500 better. He said, no, but look, my line looks better than your line. He's like, no, I like my number. I, said, I, 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 I think you're seeing stuff, but I didn't tell him that. Um, so it, it represents a rational choice for bounded rational investors. You, a bounded rational investor, you, you've got to make a decision, but it's practically an impossible decision. If you have to make a decision and the information is so wide, then you need somebody to make a decision. They're saying, we have information here that's going to help you make a decision better than the fundamental analysis. Will. Fundamental analysis, they think you can convince yourself of stuff just because there's so much, so much uh, gray area. With us, we have more, more precision. It's going to work better for you. The, the proof is in the pudding, right? Is, does it actually work or not? So I'll show you a couple of textbooks or a couple of books. Um, this is one by uh, Dahlquist, a, a former professor at UTSA. She's probably the last one to teach technical analysis at UTSA. Um, her husband works here at a local university. I don't know where she is now. I don't know if y'all remember her. I think she's been gone for quite some time, probably well before your time, Julie Dalquist. But she talked to Thick Analysis class. She taught it in the, in the FSC, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if she used the FSC, Bloomberg. Uh, I don't know what other books she's published. Uh, I couldn't get through the whole thing. I mean, nothing against her. 
But the first few chapters I thought were really, really good um, where they made the case for technical analysis. So if you're gonna be a technical analyst, you gotta make the case for it. Why do you think it works? Because it does violate a lot of academia. And she makes that case. The other place you can go is Dr. Lowe. Dr. Lowe has a book called The Evolution. This is a much re more readable book. The difference is Dalquest's book, um, where's the look inside? Why can I never find the look inside anymore? Where was it? Here? Yeah. Yeah, there used to be real obvious. You would click on the book and it would give you the look inside. Is that it? Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay. I didn't see that hand the last time I did. So, where's the, where's the index? There it is. Okay. So, the first few chapters. How does technical analysis make money? Why is it a trend? The history, technical, the controversy of it. Do markets follow a random walk? And that's where Doc, Dr. Lowe says, no, they don't. And he, he showed statistically that they don't. Um, an overview of markets. So a lot of introduction. And then she gets into the big one, Dow theory. We'll talk a little bit about that. Dow theory, you know, the trend, major trend. Uh, and then she gets in each one, sentiment market strength, we'll talk about a few of these, typical patterns. I, I, I couldn't make it, I couldn't do it because the rest of the book essentially was, here's the technical trend, here's the technical analysis, this is how it used, this is how it works, it's no longer working, next chapter. Here's the technical analysis, here's how you use it, this is how it's worked, it's no longer working, next one. Like show us something that works. It's like none of them are working anymore. Um, so she goes through a bunch of different ones. And to me, I just get, I, I get lost in it. It's just gan pan lines. You get some of the weirdest terminology. Um, so, and it goes on and on and on. These books are just, they're, to me, they're incomprehensible. I can't, I, I can't get through it. And then you spend a whole, you know, 40 pages on this thing. You're like, okay, I think I got it. And then you turn the page. However, this, this hasn't worked in the last seven years. And it's like, okay, great. I wish you'd started with that. You know, Fibonacci is interesting. I used Fibonacci when I was writing music. J.S. Bach uses Fibonacci. And it's really cool. I used to look at it. I got really excited about it. Have y'all know Fibonacci? You ever seen that? And it's pretty cool. I discovered Fibonacci. Yeah, if you're going to have a, a major climax in a piece of music, it should be relative to Fibonacci point. And so I started doing that and no one ever noticed. It's like, well, maybe it doesn't really work out that well. But, it, but Bach did that. He would notice at the Fibonacci point, Bach has something major happening. So our brains tend to think like that. Well, people have found that same pattern in stock markets. But, you know, this it's interesting. So she spends a lot of time on that. That's one that I, I do think people have are pretty interested in. Uh, but anyway, just goes on and on. And then she even has an appendix. So... I can't say I recommend this book other than the first few chapters, but if you want to get in technical analysis, I think she does a great job of going through the nitty gritty details if you can just work through it. Dr. Lowe's book is very, very different. He doesn't tell you how to do technical analysis. This entire book is to give you the academic argument on why it does work. So if you want to, if you want to be a technical trader or technical analyst, you want to do day trading, you want to have a prop desk, you need to have some basis for why you believe it's true. Other than I just want to do it. And he provides that. He goes back to ancient Egypt, <laughs> talks about people riding on horses as fast as they can. They talk about price changes. Um, he does a great job. He's a great writer too. He's very easy to read. So his book is much, much, much more readable than Dalquest. Nothing against Dalquest. It's the topic. It's not, it's not the author. The last place, uh, there's a few other places you go. I, I gave you a few websites we'll talk about. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get I'll get to Ned Davis here in a second. So anyway, so if you're going to get into this, have the basis for it. Don't assume it works and just jump into it because the academic arguments against them, against the technical analysis is pretty strong. The evidence is actually pretty strong. So you're, you're already up against something where if you can't explain why you think it works, and, but you're going to do it anyway, that's never a good way to start a career. Um, I was going to show you a technical 
analysis. I actually talked to this guy, Frank, whatever his last name is. Um, boy, this, I, I think he drinks like six gallons of caffeine a day. This guy was about as, he looked like a technical trader. He was about as high strung as could be. Intense guy, boy. And we were like, man, you know, he's so enthusiastic. We should invest with him just because he really believes what he's doing. He worked for Wellington Capital. It's a very respected firm. Um, guess where his fund is today? I just looked it up. I was telling you, go look it up. You can't. It got shut down. His performance was so horrendously bad. Um, the markets were up 20, 30%. He was like zero. Was so I don't know what he's doing today. I, I'm tempted to look him up in some place. Hopefully he's still alive. Hasn't had a heart attack yet. But um, but that was his career. He got a mutual fund. I don't know if he's going somewhere else to do that, but um, it, he did not have good success with that. Um, so as as far as websites and other places, I, I jump at the end. Here's a couple of websites that you can definitely use. Uh, this one, and for your paper, you can actually use your paper. So Bollinger Bands are, I think, a really good one to use. They look cool as graphs. They're essentially saying stocks should go within certain band of, you know, based on standard deviation. And if they jump out of those bands, that's telling you something. And so, you know, it's interesting. Um, we'll talk about moving averages. Ecomoop, I can't pronounce it. The cloud is pretty popular. It's very similar to a ball in your band. Uh, and then there's others I've never heard of before. Um, and you can see, they. I mean, this is the alphabetical of them. And there's a lot of A's. I mean, it just, there's a lot of them. Well, it's in my class notes. Yeah. Yeah. So that one's a good one. This one you might like better because the nice thing about this one is it builds charts for you that you could probably use in your paper if you wanted to. So if you wanted to build some of these charts, um, even better, and we'll talk about some of these, is uh, Bloomberg. So if you go to Bloomberg and you just search on technical analysis, they have this thing that comes up, technical analysis studies browser. And look at all the choices they have. So popular has 14. Here's the 14 they have for popular. There's a the Bollinger Band, um, Ecomuku, however you pronounce it, moving averages, obviously. Um, relative strength is one. If you really don't want to spend a lot of time on paper eight, the RSI is one of the easiest ones to do. Well, we may talk a little bit about that one. Simple moving average is a requirement for the paper, so you got to do that one. And then they got new ones. There are 17 of those. Bloomberg has their own. There's oscillators, 35 of those. Moving averages and bands, 34 of those. 12, 23, support resistance, trend analysis, third-party studies, 181 of those. But when you click on Bollinger Band, look what they give you. They give you a Bollinger Band for a company, and you can bring this up for your company. They give you a definition, and I didn't, you see I can come down the page. So you can see how paper eight is gonna be really, really easy for you. So what I'm asking for you on paper eight, you have to do a moving average and you need to do two others. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Moving average plus two others. I don't care what two others you use. So what I would recommend that you do is moving average and then find at least one really exotic, crazy one that you can bring up in an interview and they're really embraced. Right, and make sure you can pronounce it. That's the only reason I wouldn't pick this one. Um, you know, find something. Os oscillator is a simple one, and it's kind of cool to say. Um, but in, in Bollinger Band is kind of a cool one to say, and a lot of people don't know what that means. It's it's a fairly simple one. So there's some that are pretty simple, and then if you want to find two really complicated ones, that's fine. If you want to do a complicated one and an easy one, that's where Bollinger Band or uh, Relative Strength Index are pretty simple. All you got to do is write about it, where your firm is and what it's indicating for you. Is this a good time to buy? You want to wait for a particular point, those kind of things. All right. Now I realize the second you finish writing that paper, it's going to be too old. It's going to be out of date. 
that's the problem with paper eight. You wouldn't actually write a paper on paper eight. Right? That doesn't make sense. Paper. What you're doing with technical analysis is, hey, we like this stock when you find a good entry point. And that's when the technical analysis comes in. You don't write a paper about it. That just be really strange. So I'm really just getting you in the habit of doing that. Um, so you've got plenty to choose from. So you could do this entire paper sitting a few hours just next to a Blinkberg machine and you get to have the whole thing done. Or you could use these, these websites I've given you same way. Um, you know, you can, you can just click on one and they'll give you an introduction, a discussion, give you some charts. What does it mean when it crosses the lower band or the upper band? Um, and so the, everything you need is there. They, they're a lot wordier, you can see, than Bloomberg. So it kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, so you have plenty to do. So this is, this is one you could easily do from home if you don't want to have to use the Bloomberg. And here's another one. This is the Ichimoku one. A general overview displays the equilibrium analysis that was developed by this. Uh, and it's, that's not even his name. <laughs> How can you develop something that must mean something? It's commonly referred to as the start. These charts combine three technical indicators to define a price trend. Close and mid prices are manipulated to, ge to generate a pattern of signals that are plotted 26 days in the past, 26 days in the future. And along with the current price data, practitioners of this technique use these charts to identify short term momentum, long term trends, and price objectives. And then they go into the details. Now that didn't tell you much of anything, did it? But you'd have to go in a little more detail. Most of these, if you actually see how it's calculated, they're actually quite simple. They're not that, it sounds complicated, but if you look at it, the actual calculations are not, they're not that difficult to calculate. You can, you can do it yourself without too much trouble. All right, so. Do you think you can find three? Well, you only have to find two because I'm telling you, you have to use. Now, if you want to use an exponential moving average, you know, something that's moving average like, that's that's fine. I'm going to use a real simple, I'm just going to use a simple moving average. That's what we did at USA, a simple moving average. I'll, I'll even give you USA's rules. I would have been fired 15 years ago for doing that, but now no one cares because they don't do it anymore. So I'll give you Bob Davis's rules. Um, he might sue me for that, but. Uh, I don't think they work, you know, in case he's watching. So, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was kind of hilarious because at one point he got up to show the exact council how it worked. And after about five minutes, he says, well, well, it, it works. That chart's not very good. And he's like, no, it's <laughs> kind of pointed out it didn't really work. Um, so we have three on our company for all three of them? Yeah, for your company, you need to find technically you talk about. It. It's usually, if you look at example papers, this is not a very long paper. It doesn't usually take more, you know, some of them it's it's half to a page for each. So How that's not. You do have to explain a little bit what it means, but you don't, you can be as as succinct as Bloomberg and not as lengthy as that other one. Um, but the real key is interpreting the chart. What is the chart telling you? Is there something going on with this chart? A lot of times, like with RSI, there's nothing, there's nothing going on. It's not a buy, it's not a sell, it's just, right in the middle. As RSI is trying to tell you if there's something major going on, is there an overbought or oversold situation, which if overbought and oversold situations happen every day, they'd be pretty meaningless, They're pretty rare events. So if you do an RSI, you're more likely to say it's it's not telling me anything unusual is going on. So, but if you saw an overbought or oversold, then overbought say, hey, this might be a time to stay away from the stock because it's, it's got too much or if it's oversold, this might be a really good time to buy this stock. But most of the time, you're going to be right in the middle, right? All right, so you just need to find three of these. So let's let's talk a little bit more about these so you can see. But before we do that, there is one last person. Ned Davis Research. There he is right there, NBR. Um, he got bought out, so he's not... The last I heard, and I don't know, he's getting up there in age as well. The uh, last I heard, he sold at his firm and he moved to a cubicle and he just comes in and works like a regular analyst every day because he just likes this so much. He's supposedly a very unusual man. I've never met him. We use his services all the time. 
I've never met him. I don't know how unusual he is, but supposedly he's an unusual kind of, kind of unusual guy. Um, I love I love this this firm. Um, incredibly efficient firm. So you would have an idea that, um, well, you know, I think I think micro cap value stocks should do extremely well relative to other stocks if the Fed starts loosening rate rates. You send them that email within a couple of hours, they send you the last 70 years on that particular question. And they ask you, do you like this chart? If you say yes, that becomes a permanent chart that they update for you. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's really impressive. And my question is, where's your, what is your database, my word? How do you have all of that data where you can just, and it can be anything, it can be economic events, it can be uh, these technical indicators, interest rates, inflation, GDP, uh, it can be small cap versus large cap, it can be utilities versus interest rates, and all the different things you can think of. You just tell them, and boy, they bring them in. It's, uh, the one I really liked was in February of 2009. They had this one, they have the best indicators for the bottom of markets and the best indicator for the top of markets. And the best indicator for bottom market, I think there was 13 of them, I can't remember exactly. But they call us and go, you know, we've been running that for many, many, many years. And it's rare for us to see more than like seven or eight of them calling for a bottom. But right now, all 13 of them are screaming, this is the bottom of the market, just FYI. And boy, I mean, they hit it perfectly. <laughs> And we were trying like to buy more stock, buy more stock. And my boss is, I don't know. It's kind of like, no, buy more stock. Um, so that was interesting. It doesn't work at the top of markets. So that's kind of interesting with them. The top market indicators are really horrible. But the bottom of markets, boy, these things are incredibly powerful. Um, I doubt they even shown that Davis on their pictures anymore. That kind of looks like that money. Yeah, I can't forget what it looks like. It's extremely expensive. However, uh, well, one thing, the guy who got the place I took, he's the one that brought Ned Davis to us. And when he retired, he asked him if he could keep his account for free and they let him. And then they took it away from him a few years later. So he's kind of upset. But in that process, he discovered that Ned Davis is on Twitter and they provide a lot of their charts for free on Twitter. So you might look for them on Twitter and see what you can get for free. So a lot of really good charts. I wish I could show you some of their charts because they are really impressive. So what their charts do, they show you the technical indicator and they show you when you're supposed to buy and when you're supposed to sell. And then they show you what percentage of time it works and they tell you how much outperformance it provides. So I mean, that, what else do you need? <laughs> and yeah, really, really impressive stuff. Like if, if you want to know the presidential cycle, you know, how does a presidential, they can send you that in, in a second. Look, they even have Bitcoin in there. So anything you would need is in there. Pretty impressive firm, really impressive firm. But I do not know how much it, how much it costs. And they probably don't tell you if you got to ask. You can't afford it, kind of thing. <laughs> so um, here's some of their charts right here. Um, bullish on gold again. 2021 global mid outlook. It's these type of charts. Uh, just wealth information and. Boy, they can produce them so, so, so fast. I, I think what's impressive about the firm is when you call them with a question, you're thinking, I don't know how to express this. And you're kind of like, you know, I was thinking this, 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 and that. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what I mean. I'll get back to you. And it's like, okay. And they do. They understand exactly what you're asking. So they're really sharp people. Some of y'all might interview with the firm like this. You know, if you really think technical analysis is the way you want to go, this is the kind of firm you want to get on your resume and get some experience. Because you're gonna have the right kind of mathematical people where they're gonna say, no, that's not gonna work. You can go down that path, but you're gonna you're gonna waste a lot of time. So if you wanna be one of those day traders, one of those prop desk traders, this is the type of firm to put on your resume. Um, I don't know if they have jobs on here, do they? No jobs, yeah. They probably don't hire too often. But very, very impressive firm, no, no question. All right, so technical analysis. What we're trying to do is there's something going on where there's an imbalance. And a lot of time the imbalance is based on behavioral finance. Humans tend to behave in a certain way and they tend to behave that in a certain way, maybe because of their incentives, mainly because of their emotions. Uh, I'm in my executive MBA class, I talked about how 
Wall Street likes to take advantage of the retail investor because we, we do such really stupid stuff. And that just really upset her. It's like, you guys are so evil. It's like, well, retail investors are really stupid <laughs> and they're consistently stupid. And they're very, I mean, retail investors, when do they get in markets? Right at the top. When do they get out? Right at the bottom. And they're so predictable. When do institutional managers get in? At the bottom, when do they get out? At the top, that creates these imbalances. How can you tell retail investors? They do odd lot trades. I can tell institutional investors, they do round lot trades. I mean, it's this is not rocket science. I mean, this is obvious stuff. Why do institutional investors try to do the hybrid trades? They try to do kind of non-round lot, you know, to try to hide it. And you know, people are trying to trick each other. But those are these are things that are very predictable. Will the retail investor ever learn not to be stupid? No. They're always going to be stupid. They're just sitting there for the pickings and it's just easy to take advantage of them. Um, and that's where the, it's not supply and demand simply. It's who are the suppliers, who are the demanders, and they change in different markets and they're very predictable. We, and we can't possibly understand these forces. That's psychology. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist. What we're trying to do is say they exist. They're repeatable. They're, they, they come in these ways that are, can be expressed in certain statistics. There are infinite number of explanations. So ignore the why and just accept that these patterns, these supply and demand patterns cause each other. Um, and that's why academia doesn't like this. If this pattern always caused this, then it should disappear. Either the people that are causing them should learn their mistakes and stop doing it, or people should take advantage of it so it doesn't happen anymore. Um, but the supply, and this is where I think Andrew Lowe is so valuable. Um, Dr. Lowe, I do recommend this. I, do, I recommend this book, definitely, but I also recommend his other books. So this Adaptive Markets, how many of you all read this book? Anybody read this? It's 80% of this book is really, really good. Um, it's a theory he's working on. It has nothing to do with this book. And he stuck it in the last 20%. And it's like, you know, that doesn't really fit here. And his argument for why it fits. So that's the one thing I don't like. About. He's the nicest guy that I've, I've met him a few times. He's really, really, been very, very smart. And you can watch his MIT corporate finance course online for free. Uh, it's a real simple class. You might discover you already know everything in that class. But his argument here is investors adapt over time. They learn from their mistakes and they adapt and they learn. So people who went through the 2008 crisis, they become different type of people after the crisis. So he's trying to get, I think, technical analysts to realize, especially big markets, big crises like 2008 do change people's patterns and how they, so you got to be these patterns are going to change. So the patterns are still there. They just look different because people adapt. They, they do different things. It's a really, really good book until the very end. I don't know what he says in the very end. Um, yeah, he's at the very end, he's, he's into his um, how finance can cure cancer kind of thing, which is interesting. It's a really good, interesting thing, but it has nothing to do with the rest of the book. So it's really like two books in there, but I, I do recommend he's a really good writer. So it's, but he talks about how it's fear and greed. Markets are driven by fear, markets are driven by greed. If you want more insight on this, you know, go in and look for a Minsky mo moment. I don't know how to spell Minsky. Have y'all heard of Minsky moment? Not Minsky's pizza. That might be good too. Um, how many of y'all heard of Minsky moments? So go, go to Wikipedia, they'll show it to you. Uh, but Minsky talks about how markets go in these patterns. Early in the pattern, you have the institutional investors coming in, they're slowly coming in, the volumes are not very high, or they're hidden, um, they're very controlled, um, and prices start rising, and then more investors start coming in and prices rise some more. And then people start getting excited, especially the retail investors, and they start getting in. And then the retail investors get too excited and they start borrowing money to get in and prices keep rising. And then they borrow more money and they're so levered 
that when the prices drop just a little bit, what happens when you're levered and prices drop a little bit? You're desperate. You're going to get out as fast as you can. Then what happens? Prices drop. And that's what he's talking about is a Minsky moment. Really interesting stuff. Dude, Paul McCauley. Yeah, I've met this guy a couple of times. Um, I don't know why he's in there. I don't know him. Later to Minsky moments. That's kind of interesting. Uh, but um, but that's the pattern, and it's a repeatable pattern. It all has to do with leverage. Leverage kicks you to the top, and then leverage drives you down, drives you on the side because there's just too much debt, and people have to get out. They're so you know we saw that with the housing market in the U.S. in 2008. Just too much debt tracing, passing, going after these housing prices. As soon as housing prices, it's not like prices start coming down and people slowly get out. No, prices start coming down and they run as fast as they can. They got to be the first one out because of that leverage. So this is a good way to understand, I think, what they're talking about here in these patterns. Uh-huh. Is it similar to what happened with the Archibald collapse? Was that? That was a few years ago. I can't remember. You asked that. I can't remember. I'd have to look that up again. Was that related to oil prices? No, it was, no, it was a family office. that was super special. It was uh, last, uh, last, uh, I think you asked that before. I'm not yeah, that familiar yeah. with it, but yeah. Um, I don't know. You have to look into it. He's talking more about the entire market. It's not one particular investment. So he's talking about uh, tech tech stocks in the 1990s. You know, tech stocks, people borrowing money to buy companies that have never made any earnings. They have negative earnings. People buying companies that have no revenue and they're borrowing money to buy these companies. So he's talking about all overall markets. Those are traders that leverage themselves up into buying different companies. I think that's a little different. Minsky's talking globally, you know, the entire U.S. kind of thing. But certainly, debt is not a good thing if you're if you're wrong. Um, it's great if you're right. It's horrible. If you're wrong. I mean, how many people are borrowing money to buy Bitcoin? You know, that's that's kind of scary, right? So, what happens? If Bitcoin falls ten percent, and you borrow ninety thousand dollars to buy. $100,000 of Bitcoin, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You know, a 10% drop and you're negative and you're, you're, you're done. Um, these shifts from fear to greed are predictable. I mean, this is the argument. Predictable, repeatable patterns and stock prices. Humans move from extremes of optimism to pessimism. There's a lot of Andrew Lowe in this. We sell winners too fast, hold losers too long. And I think those support and the support levels and those resistant levels really reflect that. I was talking to a Jabari about this. I have this theory, I haven't been able to test it, that support and resistant, you all know that a support level is it hits it and goes back up, hits it and goes back up. Resistant, it hits it, comes back down. I have a theory that those are usually at very round numbers because people tend to think, they don't think, you know, I bought this stock at $92.32. 92 so if it hits 92.32 again, I'm selling because you know it dropped down to 80 and it came back up, came back. So next time it hits 90 to 30, what are they thinking? Next time it hits 92, I'm out, right? Because they can't remember the 32 cents. <laughs> and so I think there's round numbers, uh, but then there's also the bid ask, which I think creates some noise. And so you know I'd love to test that theory, um, but you have these support and resistance levels, and it's. I think they're tied not only to round numbers, but they're also tied to volume. So when you see heavy volume a particular day, that becomes an important either resistant or support number because there's a lot of people thinking that dollar. But I haven't had time to test that. But I do think there's a relationship with support and resistance and volumes, uh, mainly because of this ego. People love, so you buy a stock at 90, it goes up to 105, and then it drops back down to 95. Then it goes up to 105 again, drops back down to 92. What are you thinking? Man, next time it hits 105, I'm selling. Well, guess what happens? People keep selling at 105 and it keeps dropping by. Or you're going to buy a stock uh, at 90, now it's at 105, then it drops back down to 90, and you don't buy it. Like, well, next time it hits 90, I'm buying. Well, you got that round. Why 90? Why not 9115 or 9237? You know, why not? Well, because we think those round numbers. Um, all right, Dow theory. Um, is Dow theory still around? I had a student in this in one of my classes, I think it was this class. And I, I said, I wish a student would go to the hotel lobby with the uh, 
the stock trading model that they're going to give you for free. That's really not for free. Uh, Y'all seen? I don't. I don't have a TV anymore. Are those still commercials still on TV? Y'all seen those? They'll teach you how to trade stocks. And so he won. He went. He actually brought the DVD back. He says it was just like basic Dow theory. The whole thing. It was nothing that they created. <laughs> So he was, wasn't all that impressed with it, but it was really expensive. Um, something you could do yourself uh, and probably find for free out on the internet, but they were charging money for it. And what are you doing? Those are, that's real easy sell to make, right? What do you do? You just sell three stocks that worked. <laughs> you say, see, our model says buy here. If you bought here, you would have made 30%. It's so like, can you show me the other 70 stocks? Can I randomly ask you for a stock? Can you show me kind of what we did with Bob Davis? So let me show you how it works. And it's okay, here's the market today. He's like, oh, well, that's not a good chart. It's like, no, let's go back five years. I don't know, you, you tell me. Um, that's why I was teasing Jabari in his class is, would you have really sold there? Like, yeah, yeah, I would sold there. Well, but you can see the next three weeks. What if you couldn't see the next three weeks? Are you really gonna sell there? Like, yeah, yeah. It's like, I don't, I don't know anything. So Dow says there's uptrends, there's a top, there's a downtrend, there's a bottom, there's retracements, there's consolidations, you just go sideways for a while. The problem is you have to recognize primary, secondary, and noise. Primary trends, Dow said that's what you want. Those are those trends that are going to last a long time. It's the early investors coming in, there's growing confidence, middle investors come in, this is kind of a Minsky thing, and then you got the speculators at the end. So this is a very Minsky moment. And I don't know when Minsky lived. I'm sure his, yeah, where's Minsky? They don't even have his name, there it is. There's Minsky. So there, boy, that's kind of a, doesn't look like a finance person to me, but 1919, but he lived into the 90s. Um, microeconomics, um, so interesting fellow. That's very much kind of his thinking. So he's 1990, so he's after Dow. So Dow wasn't thinking Minsky moment because Minsky wasn't born yet, but uh, in secondary trends, he's saying that's what fools us. We see something that looks like a primary trend, but it's just a temporary thing and we're gonna get in and we're gonna think we're gonna ride it. And that's the thing Jabari is trying to convince me. He's like. Yeah, if, if you know, I think it's going to be in this range. Next time it comes in this range, we're going to buy, and we're hoping next time it's going to go to here. And he's, oh wait, that one didn't work. Let me show you this one. You know, that's kind of it's kind of tough, right? And he was switching between minute charts and daily charts and weekly charts and what are you looking for? And then noise is what the retail investors do. You know, jumping in and out, getting pulled. Uh, Dow said, "Err on the side of being late. Being late is better than being wrong." Being late can be really painful. That means you, know, you might be 10, 20, 30%. If you look back at the 2009, uh, that bottom was, that was a sharp bottom on that market. And boy, if you waited to make sure it was really turning, boy, you could be, I remember we had a, like a $300 million trade we're gonna do on that day. My boss calls us, no, nah, I don't wanna do it anymore. Come on. Uh, so I read an article this morning. He's, Stop reading. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's really hard. You know, everything's saying buy, 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 buy. And you read one article. When, when do all of the, when did all the articles saying the market's going to crash? When did they come out? They're heaviest and when? The bottom of the market. When do all the articles say buy, buy, buy? When they come in, they come, they come out at the top of markets. Uh, and there's actually one, that's one of the indicators. How positive are our news articles, how negative are news articles. You should buy when news articles are negative, you should sell when news articles are positive. Um, so he's saying don't try to get the absolute bottom, but 2009 was a great time to get the absolute bottom. Um, all right, so I'm gonna make you do moving averages. So here's what Bob Davis did, moving averages, 200, 150 to ones that he used. He said buy when the price is above the 50, and the 50 is above the 100, and the 100 is above the 200. Uh, the guy who was head of equities before I was, he said, well, I think I can get it better than that. And he added one thing, when all are rising. That's the one thing he added. So the current price needs to be rising, the 15, how do you know they're rising? 
where today's price is higher than yesterday's price. Okay, it's that simple, <laughs> right? That's called momentum. Does momentum work? You know, another good person you could definitely go look up. This is my uh, green. Cliff Asnes is the big momentum guy. guy. Um, you can have your minimum factor and eat it too. I don't know what that means. Uh, Cliff Asnes, he's a great, great writer. You should read everything he writes, but he also really tries hard to have crazy titles to his articles. Uh, some of them I can't read to you because they're not good for Nick's company, but um, he does try to be, try to be invocative. Um, so he's at AQR, which is a very quantitative firm. So uh, he's, he's won many, many awards for his papers and they are very good. You can also listen to him on a podcast and on YouTube. He's a very animated speaker, very interesting speaker. Um, he's, he kind of tells it like he is, man. You know, man he, uh, I love the, <laughs> what was the story 2008? I think he smashed his hand through the, uh, his terminal or something. <laughs> That's some, uh, he's a big guy, so he could do some damage to a terminal. Yeah. But um, he's the big momentum guy, and he, he says, now, he's the guy whose his PhD professor was, was uh, Eugene Palmer. And his paper was on momentum, something Fama says does not work. But Fama let him write the article and he was arguing that momentum does work. You can make money. And he says it's really simple. You just buy stocks that are higher today than they were one year ago. So it's, it's as simple as that. It's, there's no like special statistics going on. Um, so let's let's do it. Let's let's do some let's do some momentum here. What stock do you want to do this summer? Y'all name me one of your stocks. Nvidia, that would be a good one to do. Well, let's do Nvidia. So, what do we need? About as simple as you can get. You need historical prices. Um, well, at least it wasn't waste management. All right, let's. I'll go back as far now. On your papers, um, you don't go back fifty years on this stuff. To me, the only reason you go back that long is you just want to see if there's something there. Does it actually work? I have done this where um, you can go back and see if I'd actually traded like this historically, how would I have done? You've got to be really, really careful on that. Um, there was one person who brought uh, a strategy he was going to use with a mutual fund, and he showed me his data. And I pointed out to him that the majority of your outperformance was selling the Friday before Black Monday. However, to sell on the Friday before Black Monday, you needed Friday's close. You're gonna have a tough time for selling at close on Friday when you needed Friday's closing price. So he went out two more decimal places in one of his factories and he sold two weeks early. So, okay, well, that's making me even more nervous. <laughs> so he went out and found the training that would have gotten him so he didn't have that. And I was like, man, you're making me really nervous, but okay. But look how much money I'm making. It's like, yeah, but um, sounds like you're over over uh, data mining this. Okay, so what do we need? We need the actual price. We have that. We need the 50, the 100, and the 200. Now, if you're going to do some kind of exponential spooning or something, there are certain models that say, you know, more recent prices are more important than further back prices. If you want to do that, I'll count that as your as your um, moving average. So let's let's get 200 days out there. So the 50 day day moving average. How do you do that? Oh, I did. Ah, I think I brought it. You don't want adjusted price. Sorry. You want the closing price? Yeah, I don't know why I did that. All right. Okay, definitely want the closing price. I need to know. I need to know those uh, shortcuts a little bit better. All right. Sorry. Well, as I told my class earlier, if you think I'm fast on Excel, you're in a lot of trouble. I'm very slow in Excel, and because I'm an old man, so you better be a whole lot faster than I am. All right. So we're gonna 
just take the 50 day average. There it is. Just copy that down. We're not going to look back at 1999. And we want the 100 day moving average. And it really is just, just a straight, simple average. And the 200 day moving average. Why 50, 100, and 200? Who knows? They're very round numbers. I asked the guy I was working with that did the well, why don't we use 49? 99 and, and, and 199 won't be a date earlier or maybe else. Won't that give us any advantage? And what did he do? He called Ned Davis and says, hey, what if we did 49.99? Okay. All right, let's, let's just go from, let's just look at 2021. I don't know if that may be too much data, but we'll see. So 2021. I don't know this was going to look like, so it's a little scary to do it. So you're doing the one right now that you're acquiring all the information? Yeah, yeah. This is one that's, well, any, the, at a minimum, you got to do this one unless you want to do a different type of moving average. So I will allow you to do a different type of moving average, but something that's moving average like, all right, let's put some dates in here. Oops, I always do that. Sorry. That's the build date, the build gauge thing. You should have known it. Want to do that? Now, one thing you're definitely going to have to do is change your axis. So, I don't know where the starting point there is. You know, let's try 100, and let's let's go to 300. Let's go to 320. Oh, well, <laughs> see, there's, there's nothing there. All right. So the first question is, is the, is the stock higher than it's 50, 100, 200? It's definitely higher, no question. Is the 50 higher than the 100? The 100 higher than the 200, All right? So what's the only thing we don't know? Is it rising? Is it rising? The current stock isn't. Everything else. So, the, would you buy here? The current price is just dipped. If you're looking to buy or not, you wouldn't buy. Now, I didn't ask would you sell here. Where would you? Where were you bought here? So, right here, you're out, right? So it crossed right there. So you would have bought right when it crossed there because it's rising, everything is above itself. Would that have been a good buy point? Now you're all like, let's do technical analysis, right? It's like, man, this is the way to go. So you would have bought right when it crossed at 212.82. Now, when do you sell? I don't have our sell on here. Our sell wasn't when it decline because then you're going to be selling there and selling those. So I guess, um, so the only question is we can't buy here if the stock crossed and then, you know, came back down or whatever. So they all have to be rising. Now it's, there's a question if the 50 is actually rising. So we may not do it right there. I don't know where that is exactly. To 10, 15, 2021, 10, 15, 2021 right there that doesn't look right so where did it cross it crossed pretty dramatically now are you a day trader or not so if you're waiting for close and the next day you're going to buy it open we'd have to put that into the analysis i didn't keep the open i should have kept the open did it jump from 209 to 217 because of an earnings announcement who's doing nvidia when was nvidia's earnings announcement was it the 13th or the end yeah so if it's an earnings announcement, you probably couldn't, the, the open was probably too, someone looked up their open, their open was probably 216, 217. But it was rising, the 50 was rising, they were all right. So you would have bought, let's say you would have got it at 217. That would have been a pretty decent return, wouldn't it? 38% in a month, anybody take that? Yeah. Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? So that would have worked, but 
The question is, would it work previously? There's a buy point. Would you have sold there? Depends what your rule is. You say, look, look how good it did, but you, you're still in, aren't you? You're still in, you sell there. So if you bought there, you would have sold there. You would have wished you sold there. Why didn't you sell there? Yeah, I mean, there's no, no reason to sell there, right? That's kind of why I was teaching you bought yeah. Why, why are you selling there? Well, it's kind of out of my box. Yeah, but you drew the box because you saw all of that. And it's like, but anyway, he's not here to defend himself. So that's, <laughs> that's why y'all need to show up to class. Um, but now here, really a big breakdown. Um, but where the market gets really concerned is when that 100 crosses the 200, and that's not happening. Or when the 50 crosses the 100 or 50 crosses, you're not seeing that with this stock. Um, this is consolidation, right? Just going sideways for a while. Now you're starting to see some momentum. That's what we mean by min minimum. Everything's moving up. The short-term trend's moving up, and the medium-term trend's moving up, the long-term trend's moving up, and the stock's moving up. So you probably would have bought it here. You would have thought you were really smart. Then your boss is like, well, you're not as smart as I thought you were. Then, but you would have done pretty well there. That was my boss. My boss thought my IQ went from 70 to 150 week after week after week. <laughs> you're an idiot, you're a genius, you're an idiot, you're a genius. I'm like, leave my office, please. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's irritating, right? You know, it's like, these, there's, there's nothing perfect that's gonna tell you buy here, sell there. Um, now, should you be selling here? So if you're doing NVIDIA for paper eight, you got a stock that probably it's RSI. I don't think you get, get NVIDIA's RSI. Their RSI probably looks horrendous right now. They're probably, their RSI is probably screaming oversold, I mean, overbought, right? So what is the RSI saying? This stock shot way out of a reasonable band around the stock price. So it probably went insane. Boy, you need to be selling somewhere around here because of that, that sharp. So this would be an interesting one to do NVIDIA, doing momentum and, and, and doing uh, moving averages and doing RSI because RSI would be really, really interesting on this stuff. And that might be, you know, RSI might have told you sell out here. It definitely would have told you to sell somewhere in here. Um, all right, let's, let's do one more stock. Someone give me a stock that you're interested in. Say it loud. Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft. I haven't looked at Microsoft in the last couple of days. I'm not sure. Wait, let me get, did I get the maps? I think I did. Now, did Microsoft pass Apple or not? Or was that? Yeah, they're, they're uh, pretty amazing story. I don't know if that's ever happened. We should look at story. How many times has a company been the largest company in the, in the market two decades apart? Boy, we should do some research on that. Maybe you should add that to your paper eight. Okay. I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? Microsoft was a big darling, and then they everybody's like they're old old news, I'll never come back again, and here they are again. That's pretty amazing for a firm that large to reinvent themselves. That's that's pretty amazing. All right, so let me let me just keep everything. We don't need to adjust it in volume, I don't think, but let me just keep everything. So yeah, the 50, 100, 200. There it is. Now, who do you think is the first person in history to have done this? That's that's why I like the Dr. Lowe book. <laughs> You'd be surprised. You know, we think these people back in the BC time weren't too bright. Um, boy, those Greeks and those those Egyptians were pretty smart people. Um, You'll be surprised. He goes back quite a way. I don't know where he got all this history, but um, we, not everything important was developed in the last 200 years. 
And even more impressive, they were doing stuff like that without calculators. All right, so let's let's try 2000 as well. Sorry, 2021 as well. All right, so where do y'all want to start? 200 looks pretty good, doesn't it? This, hopefully Microsoft will prove to us that it doesn't work so that y'all start doing this and then sue me. <laughs> wow, that looks like Nvidia, doesn't it? Did I accidentally do this? <laughs> yeah. It's all right. <laughs> all right, so are you currently in a buy or hold or sell pattern? I mean, did I have to even explain what momentum was? If I were to ask you, does this stock have momentum? Would it be very hard to figure that out? This stock has positive momentum. Is that, that's not difficult, is it? All right, so right here, it hits the 50, but it's back down. So you probably would buy right there if the 50 day is going up, and it looks like it is. You could buy right there. That looks like a pretty tremendous buy point. You would have bought right there. That looks like a fairly decent buy point. You would have sold there. You got and gotten back in right where you were, so it wouldn't really have saved you all that much. So, all right, so I'm not proving to you that it doesn't work. This one's not so good. Not all that great of a game. The thing you gotta be really, really careful of is when would you have actually sold? So don't do like that guy does and sell closing price when you need closing price and know that you need to sell. I, I do think you can get away with assuming you buy open the next day. I do think that's, I don't think that's an unsafe thing to say. Um, but make sure, you know, you got the data and you put the trade in before open so it executes right at open. You're trying to get pretty close to open price. So that's probably a safe bet to do. Uh, so Microsoft looks a little bit better than NVIDIA in that it looks like on the 13th, you know, if that's when it, let's see, when did it actually cross? So let's get, let's get that, we're right here, right? So there's, when does it cross? We're still below, still below, well, right there. Isn't that it? Still above, no, we back below. Right there. So let's say it crossed right there. And they were up six bucks. So it's another stock that did a jump the next day. Uh, the open though, that's the open, isn't it? Yeah, so that this one looks like it would have worked pretty well. It closed at 296, it's rising, it's above everything, everything's in line. So you could have bought it at 299 the next day. And it would have been up 12%, not quite as good as NVIDIA, but still 12% in a month. Oh, we're out of time, aren't we? Sorry, man, I'm getting so into this. <laughs> All right, we'll finish up uh, technical analysis on Thursday and do some portfolio management. So, all right, I'll see y'all. Make sure I have you for attendance if you came in late. All right, so last time we got into moving averages, pretty simple thing to do. Um, I don't think I convinced you it doesn't work, but I picked two stocks with incredibly strong momentum, so it obviously works. Um, it is fun to test, to go back historically and test, but you have gotta be really, really careful that you only buy when you can actually buy. So the way I do it is if it tells me to sell, I sell it the next day is open. It tells me to buy, I buy it the next day is open. Um, if you do it so that you buy at the closing days, you'll get really, really good results to do something that's not actually possible to do. So you gotta be real careful that you try to get close, but buying it the next day is open is, is not a bad, bad approach at all. Um, so, you know, draw the lines, you're trying to find resistance, support, some kind of consolidation, which is going sideways for a while, which is kind of what I noticed was, seems to be what Uber is doing right now. Um, now Uber, the announcement for DoorDash, I think really had an impact on Uber. And so the market's trying to figure out uh, what's going on with this company. 
So if, if a firm's consolidating, boy, you're, you're really interested in the next big move. I wish you had pass your pieces. That's in there. I don't understand why UT said this internet is so ridiculous and slow. Well, I'd show it to you if we had good internet. But, um, you know, if a, a firm consolidates, then you're really, really, really watching out for a breakout. And you can you can usually tell when there's a dollar amount that is, is particularly um, psychological for the market. You can kind of just look at it. Again, I don't understand, it's just crazy. Okay, well, you can go look it up yourself. But so that consolidation, it's the market says, okay, supply and demand are battling. And as soon as the man makes a little bit of a move, the supply comes in. Whenever the supply is making a move, demand comes in. So they're watching each other and they're saying, we don't know where it's going next, but we're not going to let it get out of this range. I'm going to stop buying if it, I'm going to start buying if it goes it's here. I'm going to start selling if it hits here. And then something happens, usually some kind of news, and it breaks and it doesn't break. We talk about fundamentals. Fundamentals would say once that news comes out, it just jumps at a new value, but it doesn't do that. It usually goes there over time. Um, that's what we call the earnings announcement effect. Hedge funds have discovered this, that when a firm announces earnings, the earnings, the stock price doesn't go right to where the market thinks it should. There's this somewhat a feeling in the markets that it's like, wait, that can't be right. Or let me think about this. And it takes a bit of time and it slowly moves up or down. And you, you get that somewhat in, in the numbers. <laughs> oh, finally. So you can see there's this up and down, up and down, up and down, right? Just in a range hitting 43 kind of on the bottom, 47 on the top, and just sticking in that range up and down, up and down. Um, how long has it been there? Yeah, kind of right from here. We had this huge breakdown here from 50 bucks all the way down to 38. But since then, it's just been in this sideways motion. That's always been my complaint with AT and T. I don't know. I, I finally gave them AT and T stock. It's just like, well, yeah, I guess I should have viewed it from that standpoint. But it's just the stock that just was. I don't know when I owned it either. It's a stock that just constantly stayed in this twenty-five to thirty dollar range, and there it is again. Maybe it does have a huge dividend yield. So yeah, maybe you, you're just clipping dividends. But still, it's just so frustrating to me. It's like, okay, can you do something? I mean, if, I, if I have a huge dollar spending dollars, like, yeah. why is all that? They're going to get the dividend 40% of what it is now. Telecom's an interesting, especially now that they moved them out of telecom and into communication services. There, there are some high flying companies now. Um, all right. So, resistance support, you're looking for breakouts. You, you know, you're trying to say, there's a debate going between supply and demand and then the moving average is going to give you some indication or are they going to tear up and they're tear down or they trying to figure out which direction to go. Sentiment, um, usually you go against sentiment. So if everybody's happy, you're selling, everybody's sad, you're buying kind of thing, kind of Warren Buffett. As we mentioned last class, odd lot trades somewhat gives you a sense of where retail traders are. Um, have y'all done put call ratios? I should have told you to do the put call ratio. So the put call ratio is another good indication of um, market sentiment. Are they people buying more puts on the stock or more calls on the stock? And you can certainly do that. Um, short interest. Uh, we use short interest in investment society and Dr. Miser said, I don't like short interest. He says, it's just, it's just not a long-term view. It's just very, very, now obviously with GameStop and the, um, AMC, you know, short interest became everything for the, the, mem, the meme stops, stocks. And that's a very abnormal thing. Mutual fund cash holdings, they're usually highest at market bottoms. Margin balances, again, a retail trader, 
when margin balances get really, really high, that means retail investors are probably too optimistic. Advisors, people who shouldn't know what they're talking about, don't know what they're talking about, and they're all positive, that's a good time to get out. Why are they all positive? So what, what's the goal of an advisor? Get your money. Yeah, it's, it's to get money out of you. They have a huge incentive to be overly positive in bull markets because it's easy catching. You know, for them to be bearish, it's like that lady I talked to in 2000, the lady at my church is like, I can get my broker to buy tech stocks. I was like, tech, why would you want to buy tech stocks? Have you seen how expensive? She looked at me like I was an idiot. I was like, you know, I got a CFA and a master's degree. He said, yeah, but you don't know anything. <laughs> so, okay, well, go ahead and buy your tech stocks. But boy, I wouldn't be touching those things right now. But there's not, you know, people say, I got to do this. Everybody else is doing it. And so the advisors have to do that too, because that's the business they're in. They're in the business of turning business. And in market strength, I do like market strength. Uh, you can't do this in your model because market strength, you know, you're looking at the overall market. But the advanced decline line, if y'all monitored that before, how many stocks are advancing versus declining, that can be a good indicator. The 52 week highs versus lows, that's a good indicator. Um, looking at large cap versus small cap, that can be a good indicator. I think also looking at value versus growth. Uh, the Dow theory, he liked to look at, I don't think this probably works anymore, but it would be an interesting study, but looking at transportation versus industrials, uh, are they giving consistent signs? Um, there's one I saw not too long ago. It was really interesting, but I forgot to write it all down. But his was one of treasuries versus utilities and what indication that was giving. And it was really, really quite interesting. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different ways to try to figure out what is the market telling you by um, how much is going up. And this, this was a pretty strong one in the, two, in the 1999 because the market was going up, but more stocks were going down and going up. And so the only reason the market was going up is because a few huge companies are going up, but there was not much breadth. You all heard that term, right? There wasn't much breadth to the market. There's just a few drivers. Well, that's a pretty bad sign. At the end of markets, yeah, you're going to have, it's that kind of Minsky moment. Those stocks have been roaring. People keep throwing their money in them. They keep going up, making the market go up, but everything else is going down. If you had invested in small cap in 2000, you really didn't lose all that much money. If you avoided a high tech growth, large, you know, dot coms, you would have done okay in 2000. But those few humongous tech companies that had, you know, grossly overvalued, they drove the markets down. Um, you got to be careful of data mining. We don't use the term data mining in finance. Dr. Miser really jumped on me for saying that once. The actuaries have no trouble using the word data mining. But data mining is where you're looking for, you just throw every single thing you can and you look for a relationship. Well, if you look at a trillion pieces of data, you're gonna find a 99 R squared somewhere just because of pure random chance. And things like, you know, if the NFC wins the Super Bowl, the stock market's gonna be up. Is that true or not? Well, it worked, but you have to make all these adjustments. How do you count Pittsburgh and those kind of things? And what do you do? You go back and make the adjustments, say, oh, well, they were really, the old day of whatever is okay. Well, that just got it so that it worked. Uh, the presidential cycle, I think, is pretty interesting. Um, I don't know if y'all have seen the presidential cycle. Um, it does, it does work. Uh, it fell apart during President Obama's tenure, and the thought there was coming out of the 2008 crisis, the Federal Reserve started doing stuff that was completely unheard of. And so it just messed up the whole presidential cycle, but um, you can certainly see that. Um, Wikipedia even has that one, so it must be right. Um, but you can go back and test that. What year the presidential cycle should you invest? What year should you avoid? Um, and if you look at it historically, it does work really, really well until Obama's presidency. Um, you know, I haven't looked at it. I have to update it. I used to do this presentation for the investment society. I think I showed y'all like a year or two ago the numbers. So it, it's impressive. Uh, GMO is a, a, a Jeremy Grant, Grantham. Oh, how do you spell Jer Jeremy? Jeremy, not that one, but that's how it's spelled. I don't think he knows anything about, but Jeremy Grantham and GMO talk a lot about the presidential cycle. So he's, he says it's dead, but that was back in 2016. And he says 
you know, you can tell I stole my mine from him. Um, the Fed has curtailed. Oh, there's Financial Times. It was a good article, just like uh, Eduardo was telling us last night. Is it dead or is it just stopped under Obama? And has it come back since then? Well, the Fed's still doing those kind of things. Um, typical presidential third year says investor. There's good old Jeremy Grantham. Um, the small caps phenomenon in January, you always hold small cap in January. Why is that? Because everybody sold them in December because they didn't want them on the books and they bought them back in January. So like in December, you go, you go out and buy the big you know, headline names. So they're in your portfolio and say, yeah, yeah, we had, you had Zoom in our portfolio. Yeah. And then sell them in January. So it caused them, but that's disappeared. Um, so how do you handle the data mining? So the one thing you don't want to do is get data for every single period you have and test it. So if you want to see something works, then pick a five-year period and try it. And if it works, then try another five-year period. Don't get the last hundred years of data and say, hey, look, this works perfectly over the last hundred years. Try for a five-year period, say this works. Make sure you have some rational reason for why it should exist. What's going on here to cause it? So you start first with your hypothesis. I think this is what's going on in the stock market. Then you test it, see if it works. Okay, it worked. Then you trust it in a different cycle. So what you need is, this is called, you need an out of sample test. So what is an out of sample test? It can be different period of time. That's why you don't over test your data. You don't use all the data you have and leave yourself some period of time you can test it. You do different markets. So if you're arguing that value stocks outperform growth stocks, and you look in the United States and that works, well, does it work in Europe? Does it work in Asia? And see if the same phenomenon works. And then you test in the future. This is what hedge funds do. They come up with a theory, they test it, they test it out of cycle, they test it in other markets, they say everything looks good, we got a new model, we're gonna incubate it for three years, get three years of data. If it still works, then we're gonna give it to our clients. That's patience. Some of y'all would work well on a job like that. Um, I remember visiting one hedge fund, it was an unusual work environment. They had seven scientists, none of them had finance degrees, obviously, <laughs> they're all PhDs in math. Um, Boy, talk about a fun work environment. They just came into work and said, hmm, I think I'll study this. They do that for the next three months. You know, boss, it didn't work. So now I'm going to study this. And they pay them, you know, a few hundred thousand bucks. Eventually, they better find something. <laughs> but you got, you know, if you're going to retire next year, go find that job. You can get away a year doing nothing. And you know, they'll never know. But that's their approach. It's very patient, very slow, because they know back testing data has always got errors in it you got survivors bias, got all these kind of things and you really the only test is the future uh, a good friend of mine started a, uh, a hedge fund so i had him talk to this class a few years ago he quit his hedge fund shut it down but he was he was doing quite well i mean i think i was figuring his worst year he'd probably make a million dollars in income in a really bad year he'd make a million dollars and that's that's not too bad i think you know, I don't, his upside, he knows what his upside was. But how did he do it? Well, he quit his job. His wife had a good job, so she kept working. She worked for SMB and, um, and he just started. He, and his, he had a partner and he hired a tech guy and they just worked, got three years of data just with their money and their family's money and any friends he could, he could sucker into giving them money. Once he had three years of data, he went into the consultant databases. And if the data was good, People started calling him. He didn't have to have any marketing. Once you get into consultant database, either you have good data or you don't have good data. But consultants love to find these new startup funds that they can recommend. And that was it. That was his job. And we had, you know, I don't know, a few, several bills. You, you, you're not going to, I don't understand these firms in San Antonio that are managing $200, $300 million. It's like, you can't pay salaries. There's a firm here. I won't mention their name. I think they have maybe $200 million. They have like 10 employees. Is it uh, they own jets? Is it that? No, I don't think they own any jets. But, that's, uh... but if you charge 1%, that's $2 million a year. You've got 10 employees. 
that's two hundred thousand dollars an employee plus you got rent. Like I don't, that don't make any sense to me. I don't know how you're doing that. Um, so maybe they're charging more than that for their products, but their products were pretty basic, just stock funds. It wasn't hedge funds or anything. It was a pretty basic product. So I don't, I don't understand. There are some firms here in town that are like that, and they're they must be paying their employees seventy, eighty thousand a year after five or six years of experience. That's just not what you want. That kind of a starting pay isn't bad, but boy, it just it doesn't make sense. You need a billion dollars to work in this business. Now he he got it to work because it was three people and he had well over a billion dollars. So yeah, they could get that to work. But you know, and he was a hedge fund, so he's charging, you know, one uh, percent plus ten percent of profit kind of stuff, you know. So he's he's doing well. So but that's 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 how you get you get started, you get going, you get you have to. That's why I say, you know, don't buy a house, don't buy expensive cars. You work for six or seven years, you save every penny you have, and then you start your phone with your own money and your rich uncle's money. Get the data into the database. And then if you're any good, you're set for life. If you're not any good, you just wasted three, four years of your life. But, you know, that's the way it is. Um, I had a, a one guy I was helping, and he wanted to start his own fund. I told him, why would you, you just come out of college, you're going to start your own fund. That's a lot of work. You're going to be spending most of your time figuring out your strategy. But while you're trying to figure out your strategy, you got to work your you got to work your your front fund. You got to get employees, all this kind of stuff. And so I said, okay, I'll think about it. And someone hired them. And when they hired them, they said, hey, why don't you do some of your own hedge funds? And if we like them, we'll use them. And then if you like, you can leave and start your own firm. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a lot better. <laughs> you got all of their infrastructure. Because the problem is you start a new business, you're going to be spending 80% of your time starting your business. And what are you going to be spending your time? On your strategy, right? Isn't that what you're selling, your strategy? If you don't have any time to build your strategy, you're spending all your time building your firm. You're, it's not going to work. So find a better way to do it. You don't need to start your own firm at 23 anyway. Unless you're just, you know, James Simons or somebody. So... All right, so some favorites, moving averages are pretty popular. RSIs, Bollinger Bands, those are pretty pretty similar. Trend lines, those, you know, if you if you look at um, FinViz, they do a pretty good job of putting those putting those in there. I don't know if I can find a good good company here. There's some major movers. A pretty boring market today. So they'll put those lines in for you. I don't know exactly the technology that does that. Uh, how do they know to connect this to that? Do you think there's some person drawing these? That'd be a lot of work, wouldn't it? You need a computer. How does computer do that? And what are these lines? These are pretty obvious. What's that? Moving averages, right? What do they use? Why do they have an S in front of it? Just a simple, it's not exponential moving average. So what is this stock doing? Looks pretty strong, right? You might've bought it where, right about here somewhere, but would you got that? You know, people say, see it works for a while, I would've bought right here. Well, you sure right there? Yeah, I definitely would've bought right there. I don't know. That. <laughs> so, but they do a good job. So FinViz can be good. Their, their charts are, are pretty, pretty, uh, Professional looking, and you can certainly cut, cut and paste them in. Um, MACD, similar, you know, if you just, you're trying to give more weight to the, the near term versus the longer term. And then the BTST, there's a function I can never remember. If you just search on technical analysis, you'll find it in Bloomberg. But if you go into Bloomberg, so paper, paper aid is a paper you can go to Bloomberg Lab, sit there for a few hours and probably write your entire paper and go home. It's the easiest of the papers. Everything you need is in Bloomberg. Or you can do it from home and those other sites I showed you. You don't necessarily need to um, have a Bloomberg machine. Okay, I showed you some of these, these sites. Um, you're, so again, you're perfectly welcome to use those or others. Anybody have other sites that you use? See, Jabari's not, where's Jabari? Jabari, are you online? So I forget what, he's trading view? Trading view, yeah, that's all I used to. Yeah, that was pretty sweet looking, but it looked like you have to have a subscription. There's another one called uh, Coin, K-O-Y-F-I-F. 
So it's kind of like treating you, but it doesn't like bug you with like the subscription thing. And you still feel limited. But too much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's it's another one. Um, they probably charge for something, right? Yeah. Like some do. advance. Do you have like different screeners, and that's like where they start charging you. The bar said they had a fairly inexpensive one where you can get almost everything you need, and then you get more expensive with stuff that you could probably do without. A lot of your obviously a lot of your brokers are going to have this stuff in Meritrade, those kind of places that have stuff that can probably do some pretty good charting. Uh, so experiment and see what, what works for you. Um, all right. So anything else we need to do on paper eight? So Next Monday, Tuesday, I'll be here on campus. We're going to talk some portfolio management, which is one of my favorite topics. So, um, so we're, we're not going to talk about the last paper for a couple of classes. We'll probably save that for the last class. Um, and so then on Monday and Tuesday next week, we won't have class in here, but I really want to get students that are behind caught up. So some students haven't submitted any papers yet. Either it's just too late and impossible. So if they haven't submitted anything and they have no draft yet, that's it's kind of too late. We can't do this class in three weeks. Um, but I can help them get them caught up. There's some things like I know um, I don't want to meet on paper four. And unfortunately, I was just too busy today, but I can certainly on paper four and get people caught up really fast on that paper if you're struggling with paper four. Paper three, you should be able to do off the videos, but if you need help on that, I can certainly help too. Is, you know, you just got to do your own thing. Five and six, the videos should help. You should have a pretty good start on five and six. Seven is another paper where if you need some help, you can catch me in FSC. We can probably get all of your Excel done, get it saved, so you can email it to yourself. Um, the students hardly ever take me up on that. So yeah, if you want to sit down and, well, Eric and a few of you there, yeah, Henry did. So yeah, if y'all want to sit down and it's best to set up the time so it's dedicated and just get you caught up as fast as possible. Uh-huh. Whenever, whatever the syllabus says is the due date. There's one paper due next week, right? No, no, I mean like a lot of papers in the 10th. Well, I had to have everything at least a couple of days before grades are due. I haven't been counting off for blank papers, so I'm kind of facilitating procrastination. Um, but I have to have something before, you know. If, so if you don't turn in, if you don't turn papers in, I can give incompletes. Ninety-eight percent of incompletes end up as Fs, so it's that's never a good sign. Uh, I can't give an incomplete if I don't have some grades, though. Um, the official UTSA is a student has to be passing. So if someone's turning five papers, there's no way that they're passing. But I have fudged that a little bit. Um, so you know, I want y'all to be successful, but it's a hard class. So you got to put the time into it. I can't put the time into it for y'all. Um, over half the class is there. They've turned in all the papers and are passing. There's some that have turned in some papers or some haven't turned in any. So, you know, next week, I'm hoping those that haven't turned in any, can, I can get them caught up. If you're in great shape, you know, it's like, man, my average is 93.2. I got to get that up to 93.5. So I'm going to spend 10 hours for the rest week next week. That's fine. But boy, that's, I'd rather work on those that are really far behind <laughs> and help them out. All right. So this is your chance to catch up. So next two years, we're going to have a class. Well, our class, I'm going to be down in FSC. So I'm going to be helping people one on one. So yeah. So there's, I'm just going to count everyone here as present. I mean, everyone is present. So there won't be any Zoom or anything like that. So I'm trying to let y'all get caught up with the class because we're doing pretty well on time here. And plus, um, you know, it's it's a class that has a lot of out time, outside of class time. All right. All right. So what I want to do here is I want to talk about portfolio management because if you're interviewing with a security analysis job, you really got to understand the portfolio management side of this, what you're getting into. Oh. And I do want to talk some on careers in this. Just real quick, you know, my career, I started as a security analyst, didn't work as a security analyst all that long. When I started, 
we had Blumberg machines, but we didn't have a Blumberg machine on every desk. So I had to go to a common area. We didn't have Bloomberg that could dump into Excel. So you essentially had to get Bloomberg and you had to manually key everything. Um, so it was, we had Excel, we had computers, we had electricity, but we didn't have the ability to get massive amounts of data. So everything was built kind of manually. Um, and then I moved to an asset strategy department and then they made me portfolio manager. It was a really strange career. So I'll talk about the career. My career was just so bizarre. It's not the normal way you would, you would do portfolio management. But I want to talk about the portfolio manager because that's whom you're working for. So they are managing the portfolio. We're going to say of stocks in one particular universe. What universe might that be? It could be US large cap. U.S. small cap value. You know, there's all different ways you can define it. Could be my friend in New York. Could be emerging markets. Could be developed markets, etc. So you define your universe. Once you define your universe, that's essentially going to define what stocks you have to choose from. Um, U.S. large gap, what do, you, what do you usually think of there? So Russell 1000, how many stocks in Russell 1000? About 994 or so. They only reconstitute it once a year. So during a year, you have a fewer or more than that. Small gap, we usually think of the Russell 2000, but there are a lot more stocks than that in the United States. So there's actually the Wilshire 6,500. So there's obviously a lot more stocks than just 3,000. These 1,000 stocks here are probably 85, 90% of the US stock market though. So that's the bulk of it. If you add the 1,000 and 2,000, you're well over 98%. So those other 4,000 stocks are just puny, puny, puny stocks. So if, if you're going to do portfolio management, what do you do? So let's say you're in an interview and they're asking you how you invest, what's your, what's your strategy? So you need the components of a portfolio process or strategy, I don't know what word to put there. Now you need to do this. I used to do this as a paper in this class before we did the research report. Now I would have students actually build this document and boy, students, some students are like, I can't do this. It's just impossible. It's, you've got to do it. You've got to figure out how to do this. So the first thing you have to do is you have to have a philosophy. We'll talk about that. You have to have a philosophy. Then you have to have a process. Then you have to have a construction, a full construction. Then you need risk management. Risk management is your um, cell discipline and you're rebalancing, all right? You need this. If you can't come up with one, then go steal somebody's and just make it your own. Be real careful you don't get too precise because they may hear you and say, oh, that's Jeremy Grantham. That's uh, Ken Fisher. It's like, oh, oh yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> so maybe still Ken Fisher, but Tweak it enough so it doesn't sound like Ken Fisher or Jeremy Grantham. So a philosophy starts with the words, I believe. And the I believe is, I believe these type of stocks will outperform the market over time. Okay. Now, when I was at USA, I wanted us to have an I believe or we believe statement. And I worked so hard on it, I failed so miserably. Uh, I remember me and Cliff had this debate. Sorry, Cliff, if you watched this video, but I wanted a distinct USA, we believe, and Cliff was like, we believe diversification is important. It's like, everybody believes that. So let's, we believe invest for the long term. Okay, everybody believes that. I wanted something very specific. So for USA on the fixed income side, it was pretty obvious. This was their, I believe, I'll give you a few of these. We believe starting yield is most critical. That was their belief. A bond with a yield of 
it's going to give you a better portfolio return than a bond with a starting yield of 3%. Pretty simple. Credit risk of constant, right? So they said it's yield. It's all about yield. Give me a higher yielding bond. Don't don't say I'm going to buy this bond at 3.2 because I think it's going to be upgraded or whatever. No, no, tell me that. Give me a good solid triple B bond with a 4.2 percent yield, and that's better than a 4 percent yield. Over time, we're going to be we're going to beat the market. That worked really well for them for many, many, many years until 2008, and then it crushed them in 2008. But it worked really well. They were the number one bond manager. We had all these awards. They did a really, really good job, and they had one really bad year in 2008. But we had that statement. I want to say, well, let's put that down. There's a no, no, we can't say yes. Well, let's have a statement. So you go to Fidelity. What does Fidelity believe? Fidelity. We believe we like your money. That's it. That's what Fidelity believes. What does Fidelity do? They have 500 or so mutual funds. They know at any given time, 50 or 100 of them are doing great. They market those to death. And then when those fall out of favor, they find the next 20 they're doing well. They market those to death. They close down funds strategically so that their star ratings are not hurt because that's a game they all play. Morning star, how many morning, how many morning, morning star stars? Well, over 50% of our funds are three stars or higher. Well, why is that? Well, because all the two and one star star funds we shut down or change their strategy so they don't have stars. Anymore. Well, that's cheating, but it sure sounds good on the commercial. I don't want to work for a firm like that. So my I, my question is, what does USA believe? So when an investor comes to us, they know what we're doing. Well, USA was pretty obvious. USA was value investors. Okay, that's fine. It's okay to be a value investor. Doesn't work really well the last 10 years, obviously, but be a value investor. What does that mean? Let's put that down. What, how do you define a value investor? All right. Our GMO. GMO is a good example. GMO is. Okay. I don't know who it is. Did I get them? Yeah. Okay. Hope they're not. Do we need to call the police? Or? <laughs> All right, so I mean, a real popular strategy, probably the most popular strategy is GARP. You all probably all heard of GARP. So, what is GARP? Anyone guess what is GARP? What's the G on GARP? Growth. This is probably the most, well, most popular strategy out there growth at, growth at a reasonable price. Yeah. I don't know how to spell reasonable. That's not a reasonable it's spell reasonable. So GARP, real popular strategy, growth at a reasonable price. We want growth. Companies are growing fast, but their stock's really cheap. Like those things are just lying around everywhere. Um, growth at a reasonable price. That's not a value strategy. That's a growth strategy, but it's a value, it's a growth strategy with value as kind of its core. Well, GMO is quality at a reasonable price with momentum. So they have two things in their strategy. If you go look at the website, they believe in quality and they believe in momentum. And they view them as two separate things. They say quality is work, quality reasonable price is working sometimes, momentum is working sometimes. They're not co correlated to each other. So when quality is not working, momentum is helping us. When momentum is not working, quality is helping us. And that's their two strategies. They have some mutual funds that are 50% quality, 50% momentum. They have some that are 80% quality, 20% momentum. That's their strategy. Is that understandable? Well, what do you want to know? How do you define quality, right? So we're going to talk about philosophy to the process. Your philosophy is in words what you believe. Your process is how do you actually find those companies? So you go work for GMO and they say, hey, uh, Go find all the quality companies. Wouldn't you want to know how they define quality? Wouldn't that be helpful? And they they define it very precisely. They have statistics that they list that say this is our definition of quality, so that you know exactly what they're looking for. You would think quality companies would be more expensive than low quality companies. That should be the case. There's been times actually when quality companies were on sale. And GMO gets really excited when that happens. 
That's what we call junk rallies when junky stocks do well and quality stocks don't do well. GMO is a big buyer in those markets. But you need something along these lines. I would not use this in your interview just in case. I mean, Jeremy Grantham's pretty famous, you know, so tweak it a little bit. But that's what you're looking for. Let's say you're, a, I, I don't know, I don't follow this lady. Is it Wood or Woods? Wood. Is it ARK? All right, so I don't know her strategy. I don't read much on that. Let's say you want to do this. So we want we want the innovators. All right, that's a cool strategy, right? You don't have to be right all that much. You just got to find one or two that kill, and the others can go bankrupt, and you got a good job. So you're just trying to find the next Microsoft, the next whatever. You're not going to buy Tesla because Tesla's already a multi hundred billion dollar firm. It's too late. So what are you looking for? So they, then you get down the process. How would you do that? Well, try this out. I want firms with fast growing revenues and large losses. And why would you want that? Why do you want companies losing money? Because they're young. They're young. So what are you looking for? Operating leverage, right? You want firms as their revenues grow, their costs won't grow, and they're going to suddenly just like the Amazon, just suddenly they have earnings when they didn't have earnings forever and ever and ever. What would happen if you did this? How hard would it be to execute this process? Fast growing revenues, what, over three years, four years, five years, you define that with large losses. Very easy to find that list of companies, isn't it? Um, you also want to make sure off a small base, right? You don't want the JC Penney's and the, you know, those firms that, you know, I don't know, they've had fast growing revenues, but you don't want firms that are losing money because they're going out of business. So you want firms that are small come up base, or you might even have, or no revenues. If you buy a firm that has zero revenues, so some buy a medical firm, they're researching an Alzheimer's drug. They think they may be close to finding finding it. Would you invest in a firm like that? What happens if someone finds a cure to Alzheimer's? What are, what's their revenue going to be? A few hundred billion a year, right? Is that a drug your grandparents are going to take if they have Alzheimer's? My guess is they'll, they'll pay $100,000 a year for that drug, no doubt. Is Medicare going to pay for it? What if Medicare says we're not going to pay for that? We're going to have a, you know, have a Cadillac run on the federal government. Yes. What if they don't find a drug? Well, you lost money on that company. You hope somebody else. Uh, I, I think it was Jeremy Grantham or somebody. I can't remember who. He was talking about this firm that was developing batteries. They had no income, no revenue. But if this battery worked, well, every car in the world is going to have this battery. That, that gives me interesting. If I was a Kathy Woods, what is, what is Kathy Woods actually buying? I've heard some of her names. Yeah, but when does she buy Tesla? Yeah, I don't see how Tesla fits that, that model. I mean, it's yeah, they're they're a disruptor, but the market's already priced that in. I mean. What more can you do? Tele, Teledoc Health. There's there are a lot of Shopify. I don't know if they quite fit that either. You know, I I might add into me into mine. Um, market cap less than a billion. You know, so this is my. I, mean, I want these firms that are going to take over the world. And so I, I'm looking at these interesting now. This might end up being 2,000 firms or something, you know, those really, really small firms on the bottom. So I'm going to have to find some other way to bring that down. Um, Square, I don't know if they, Twilio, I don't know how many of these really fit. Some of these fit really well, maybe two or three years ago with my philosophy. Today, it might be a little too late. I don't know some of these firms at all. Intellia, Therapeutics, that sounds like there may be something there. Twitter, does that work anymore? What does DraftKings do? Uh, some, you know, there's some interesting names in here that you would want to go. It's a lot of Bitcoin stuff in here. Um, but do you think you could uh, specify her strategy? 
pretty well. It's kind of a mixture of company sizes, but definitely she's looking for firms that are going to revolutionize some market. That's interesting. That's exciting. Um, so, so you want a philosophy, you got to state your philosophy. If you don't have one, then go with GARP because that's what everybody uses. Everybody wants good growing companies that aren't expensive. I don't think they exist, but you know, if you're going to tell yourself they exist, that's fine. Go find a cheap stock that's doing great and making a lot of money, growing relatively fast, and the stock market hasn't noticed it. Yeah, there's like thousands of those companies sitting out there. All right, now process is you've got, you've got to figure out how to go from universe, buy list, to acquire list. And you got to do it efficiently. And firms are very, very different. So you have, I'm going to show you some of these firms, um, some of these pitch books. You have firms that are 100% computer. The entire process, all the way down to acquire is computer. There's one firm I use. I don't know if they're in business anymore. Um, they were a fun firm to work with. I really enjoyed these guys. One, their, their portfolio manager spoke to this class several years ago. He's the one that got me on the rolling beta thing. Um, really, I mean, I don't think he's still alive because he was like 107 then. And that was like 20 years ago. So I don't know if he's still alive. I hope he is. He was such a nice guy. Um, interesting, interesting firm. But they had a computer model. They ran it once a month and they traded once a month. I was like, what do y'all do the rest of the month? And so my, my sales rep, a guy named Joe, I still talk to him, interesting guy. He was a, a pro baseball player, got injured and so became a portfolio manager. Nice guy, I love talking to him. But I dreaded him calling because we were on the phone like for three hours. He, like, he was just like talking about everything. Um, but interesting, interesting guy, a lot of background, a lot, a lot of interesting stories from his, uh, his investment world. Um, so they ran their model, all quant, and their trade desk was critically important. Their trade desk had to get the right price, had to make sure they weren't getting killed in the purchases, uh, but that was their firm, all computers. Um, some others I've seen, there's no computers at all. These are people, I remember a real estate investment trust investor, they just knew the market. They'd been in it for 20, 30 years. They knew all the companies. It was just, everything was just fundamental analysis, looking at financials. And REITs, there's a small enough number of them, or there were back then, that they could handle that volume. This wasn't like all tech stocks or all consumer staple stocks, so they could handle it. And it was no computer, entirely kind of seed the pants, kind of just our intuition kind of stuff. So you've got to get from the universe to a buy list to an acquire list. So I'll give you some examples of that. Um, you have to have some things that are measurable. If you're going to do a computer screen, it has to all be measurable. It has all be data. So what if you're going to do, what if one of your criteria is quality of management? So you say, I want growth at a reasonable price led by a management team that is extremely strong. Well, how do you measure extremely strong management? My approach was always, I want to hear them talking. That's why it's so focused on, you know, go to YouTube and listen to your CEO. Uh, we tried that with the CFE research team and there's what we found in what one, who was, who was that I was talking to? I don't remember. But we found one video of the manager and the CEO talking, it's such a small company. Uh, quality of management. At USA, that worked pretty well because firms would come by USA and we get to talk to them. It wasn't always a CFO or CEO. Uh, it was usually the head of their investment relations, but they, they're pretty smart people. Uh, but I would rather hear the CFO or CFA, I mean, a CFO or a CEO. The best way you can do this is investment conferences. And I've been hoping that because of COVID, more and more investment conferences are going online, that even after COVID, they'll still have a Zoom and they'll record them. Uh, I have seen some out there that you can find. They're, they're wonderful things to go to. The CEOs of the companies come in and they do an hour, two hour presentation. They're very, very insightful, very interesting. Um, you know, the, the final actually signed up for one through there. Mm -hmm. um, it's been, like, for my company, it's been built by ASML, which is a competitor, but they're bringing in all like their CEOs. Like, from one was it a free to sign up? Um, it is free, but I had to like mail the, like, the, the, the hosting 
Oh, email right. them to Bloomberg and basically say, yeah. I'm a student doing research. Can I like attend the meeting? Yeah, usually it's free because you're a client of whoever's hosting the event. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure they saw like something from Bloomberg. So they have like yeah. no issue sharing it. That's good. I mean, yeah, I need to research that more because they're really, really good. I love these conferences. They're fun. They're more fun to go to because you get all kinds of free stuff, <laughs> um, free umbrellas and whatever, t shirts. I always go for the t shirts. Um, but you also get to meet a lot of people, it's a networking opportunity. But to meet, and then you have the, the booths that you can go around and talk to everybody. It's just really, really wonderful. So if you're a security analyst, you just got to beg your boss. They are more valuable to actually go to them because of the networking. Um, but online, if they're online and watch some of these, they're probably good for an interview to say you watch some of these. But obviously, the earnings call is another place. You get to hear the CEO or the CFO responding to questions. It's always interesting to me, someone asks a question and neither the CFO or the CEO answers, but the investor relations person jumps in and you're like, okay, well, why isn't the CFO talking? That sounds like a question they should know the answer to. Or if the CEO talks for the first three minutes and then you never hear from them again, it's like, okay, wait, they're just not engaged in this company. Um, or you have Elon Musk talking, which is always in butt cycle. Um, but if you're gonna have quality of management, how are you gonna do it? There's, it's hard to do that in an Excel spreadsheet so if you're going to measure quality of management, then you're going to, have to be like a JP Morgan where you have your analysts have actually have to put a score on management. So DoorDash, wow, they got great, great, great management. They know the business. Okay, that's interesting. How did you decide that? Well, you just, it's a subjective opinion of, of your analyst. Um, if you have growth is one, then you can measure that. You just have to pick period of time. You can be revenue growth, earnings, those type of things, but growth is a pretty easy one to do. Um, but your process is gonna try to get you from that universe down to a buy list. And usually what happens is it's computer and then it's hands-on analysts, except for the pure, pure client firms. So develop, and what I did when I was grading these papers is, okay, give me your philosophy and then show me your process. And what I wanna see is a clear link from your philosophy to your process. So you say, I want fast growing firms that are not overpriced with strong leadership. So I wanna see in your process, the first thing you said was fast growing. Exactly how you're measuring that. Give me the exact metrics that you're using. What else does it say? Not overpriced. So you say the relative PE must be 10% or less in industry. Something like that. Can you measure that? Yeah, you get the PE of the industry and you only find stocks that are at least 10% or below that relative PE. Okay, that's pretty easy. What else does it say? Strong leadership. How do you measure that? It's probably gonna be subjective. If you're saying I'm going from 2000 stocks to a buy list of 10, and one of the things I'm gonna measure is quality of management, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see how you're gonna do that. How would you get from 2000 stocks to a buy list of 10 and quality of management is one of your items? Is there a place you can look up management IQ? You get their what schools they graduated from, you know, that's gonna be a really, really tough one. So anything, and this is what I graded on, anything in your philosophy better be in your process. There better be a one-to-one -one link. So don't give me these uh, um, with good um, market potential. If you're gonna say with good market potential, then tell me how you're gonna find firms with good market potential. All right, that sounds good. What does good market potential mean? A growing market. Well, how do you measure that? You can measure that in some way. You want firms that are in a growing market, but if it's in your philosophy, it better be in your process, All right? So this is a mistake a lot of students would make. They would just say these nice, nice sounding things in their philosophy, but it's, it's not measured anywhere. Well, if it's not measured anywhere, then don't put it in your philosophy. Some of the things that are 
kind of not so miserable, that's when you say, okay, my computer is going to do the miserable things. I'm then going to do those subjective things. I still want to know how you're going to do it. You're saying strong leadership. How do you define strong leadership? What do you mean by strong leadership? Give me some, some adjectives. What, how do you actually, yeah, how long did they get in the industry? Where did they come from? Like for me, like with my CEO, like he's only been in the last two years, mm -hmm. but um, like talking about him, like, yeah, like a ton of experience in the industry because his company was acquired by my company. And prior to that, he really had good education and like a strong performance. Yeah, I have, I have a y'all heard my bias. If it's a really technical business, I want a really technical CEO. That's just my bias. Um, that's not too hard to measure. I don't know who runs uh, Valero right now. Is it a petroleum engineer? Anybody know? Who's the CEO of Valero? I should know that, right? They're right here in town. I guess I should know that. <laughs> oh, you want to know his or her salary? Um, <laughs> Joe Gorder. I don't know who Joe Gorder is. I don't think I've ever heard of him before. So Joe Gordor. Gordor. Bio. But that's one of the things I'm, I'm you know, Falero is a very complicated business. Great. Uh, <laughs> I don't get out of it. Where's the X? Oh. Okay. okay. All right. Well, anyway, so that, you know, I want to see it's, I, I'd rather have a petroleum engineer or a trader, a commodity desk trader, or, you know, someone who really understands the in and outs of this business. Um, it's interesting, a few, a few of our students have interviewed with Buckle, and I think you're talking about Buckle, and it's run by a, a life actuary, but I kind of like having an actuary of an insurance company. USA never had an actuary run its, its insurance business, and it was really interesting when Bob Davis came in. He was a banker. Boy, did he get baptism by fire. He thought he knew financials and insurance. He was like shocked. I was in meetings where he was like banging us. He's like, there's no way that's true. Yeah, that's, that's true. You can't charge the prices you want to charge. You have to get every state has to approve what you charge your customers. It's like, oh, that's communism. Why is it? That's, that's the business you are now running this business. I remember I told him that once and he was like, the CFO, a good friend of mine, she was the CFO of the company. He goes, is that true, Susan? She goes, oh, yeah, sorry, Bob. Like, I wasn't lying. I wasn't lying. I'm not really. I'm not really But anyway, I mean, he kind of figured out. He was a smart guy. Obviously, figured out over time. But um, it's a very, very different business, and it's a tough business. Um, all right. So there's your process. You're kind of doing this process when you build your model for paper seven. So if you looked at what I do in my in these models, it's essentially a very value oriented. So I want, it's almost a quality at a reasonable price, if you look at mine, not a growth at a reasonable price. Unfortunately, quality at a reasonable price doesn't really spell anything. Um, I don't know how you would pronounce that corp, I guess. So, but you can try that in, a, in an interview. I'm a corp investor. Let's see if we can get it started, right? I've always wanted to start a term. So yeah, I'm a corp investor. And just see how it goes, see what they say. You know, if, in an interview, if you say something that you, you just assume everybody knows, you can see, you know, the psychology, will they question you on it or not? You know, if they say, yeah, 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 corp, yeah, I've heard of that. You know, like, oh, this, this guy is smoking something. All right. All right, so you've, you've got, you got your process, what you're building for paper seven, then you got portfolio construction. This one's pretty, pretty tough. You know, the easiest thing is equal weight. And there is a lot of documentation that shows that Eagle Oaks works pretty well. It's the easiest. For a small investor, you can certainly get away with the equal weight without too much trouble. Um, you can have a model weighting. There are optimization models, especially at hedge funds, um, where the model actually, and, and some of these are really, really sophisticated. They say, if we buy this stock, it will add 10 basis points to our expected return but the trading costs are 12 basis points, so it doesn't make any sense. So they got how much we think it's gonna add, 
versus how much it's going to cost. And the model will tell them. And I've seen some that are, I mean, you won't believe it, but I've seen some that are efficient frontiers. To me, it seems pretty crazy, but they got a thousand stocks where they have an expected return, an expected volatility, an expected correlation. And the model, they put all that in. And the model gives them essentially an efficient portfolio after trading costs. You got to put after trading costs. And yeah, we tell them exactly what to do. It can be subjective uh, based on conviction. It can be some kind of weighting approach. I saw this at JP Morgan. JP Morgan was, um, you know, they have hundreds of analysts, and analysts will rate every stock in, in quintiles one, two, three, four, five. And then the model, the computer will say, we're going to buy as many ones and twos as we can, and we're going to overweight them. We'll buy some threes, so we get our sector weights like we want them. Maybe we have to buy a few fours, we'll keep those as small as possible. So the weighting is we want as many ones and twos as we can get, but we can't buy all tech stocks. So we're going to buy some consumer staples, and we have to get down the threes and fours. The computer does the entire thing. It's just like that model at that firm I was talking about. The computer tells them everything. They were an equal weighted mark, mark the model, so it made it a lot easier. Um, but you can actually Google that. Um, there are a lot of PhD papers out there that study that. A fundamentally weighted, you could certainly do that as well. Y'all know what fundamentally weight is? Good old. Um, uh, Randy Arnott. So you can wait by income or assets or revenue or whatever. So if a firm has $5 billion in income and another firm has $2 billion in income, you put 5% in one and 2% in the other, whatever, you weight it by the income. This is pretty critical. If you're a portfolio manager, you're not just going to randomly put stocks into your portfolio. You need to know exactly how many shares you're going to buy. And if you don't have a basis for that, you better research and figure out what is the best approach. In investment society, we've always used equal weight, mainly because I'm lazy and it, there is strong support. Now, why does equal weight work historically? Anybody guess? Let Asnes will tell you why equal weight works. What is equal weight going to give you? It's going to give you Two, two biases in your portfolio. So think about it. You're going to put. Well, if you if you equal it, you will have to rebalance because tomorrow one stock's going to go up, one's going to go down, and no longer equal bank weights. We're going to talk about rebalancing. So that does great. So, well, let me tell you, and y'all tell me why this is the case. It gives you two biases: value and small cap. Why does equal weight give you a value bias and give you a small cap bias? Any guesses on that? So if you equal weight, you are a value investor and you are a small cap tilt investor. Well, they're smaller. Right, so if, if Apple is a growth, you know, growth means what? It's expensive and large cap, and it's 6%, how much do you put in there? You put 1% in there. If you got a Campbell soup that is value and small cap, and so they're 0.2% of the market, and you put 1% in there, what have you just done? You just bought more small cap and just bought more value. Almost by definition, and really is by definition. Value stocks are cheap, and so when you equal weight, you're gonna end up with a higher weight than value stocks. And if you're equal weight, then the larger companies can be underweighted, the smaller companies are overweighted. What two strategies have worked extremely well the last 50 years? Value and small cap. Until the last 10 years, when growth really took over in large cap. But up until the last 10 years, yeah, if you, you equal weight, you're essentially a, a small cap value to investor, and that strategy has worked really, really well. So, you know, and that, that's what I like about Cliff Essence. He says, it's not that equal weight works, it's that value and small cap works. And you just have a construction strategy. Now, do you wanna know that if that's a bias in your strategy? Don't you wanna acknowledge that? 
because now your boss is asking, well, why are we performing so well so for the last 10 years? Well, we have an equal weighted strategy. Well, why would that do it? Well, because you know, you need to understand if you have a bias that's going to cause you to underperform when small cap and value underperforms and you don't know it, you sure don't want to find that out after the fact. And your boss says, why are we going to perform? I don't get it. Uh, well, it makes perfect sense why you're going to perform. Um, if value stocks and small cap are extremely expensive, then you might want to change your equal weight strategy and get out of that particular strategy. Um, all right. The next thing you've got to watch is your risk. Any questions on the weighting? You've got to be explicit about it. I mean, I, I know some managers like, wow, we really like this stock. Let's buy 5%. Well, okay, but that seems a little random to me. Be a little more thought, thoughtful about it. Okay, risk management has two pieces to it, a sales discipline and a rebalancing. Since we're talking about rebalancing, let's start with that. The question here is how often and to what? So if you're equal weighting, you're gonna have to rebalance every three minutes if you're truly equal weighting, because every time a stock price moves, you're no longer equal weighted. In fact, in the 60s, when they started index funds, the first ones were equal weighted and they quickly discovered that's not gonna work. Because <laughs> these big investors like Fidelity, they can't be equal weight because it's just too much trading. You're gonna get destroyed with the trading. Small investors can get away with equal weighting because now with commissions being free, the bid ask is not killing you all that much, but it's tough to rebalance. So if you read studies, they're gonna tell you quarterly is optimal, but I don't know why, because I haven't read one of the historic studies in a while. Why is quarterly optimal versus monthly versus weekly? And I think it's a balance between, you're balancing a few things. First is momentum. If you believe in momentum, do you want to rebalance? Your good stocks keep going up, your bad stocks keep going down. Do you want to sell your good stocks and buy your bad ones? So that's an anti-momentum strategy. The second thing is trading costs, obviously. So you don't want to, you know, be trading so much that you're, you're, you're killing yourself there. And the other thing is just risk. So if you let your winners keep rolling and your losers keep losing, losing, and you end up with, uh, you know, Tesla's 83% of your portfolio, that could be a problem, right? So at some point, and this is what we did in the investment society. We said, we're not going to rebalance except when a particular stock gets this much out of line or an industry gets this much out of line, we're gonna rebalance just that stock in that industry, all right? So we'll allow a stock to get up, we'll buy it at 2% for the portfolio, but if it gets to be 3% or whatever, I forget exactly what our rules were, um, we're gonna cut back and go back to that. And how do we cut back? Well, if a stock got really too high, then I'm gonna, look for an industry that we're kind of under own, own and go back to that one. So I allow it to run a little bit, but let's say your arc. I'm gonna make a, a, a pretty radical statement. I would say never rebalance. If you're looking for innovative stocks. If you're looking for the next Microsoft. Do you wanna sell it? Do you want that thing to do what? Run, run baby, you know, forest, Jump, whatever it is. Run, baby, run. All right. If you're that kind of strategy, I would say don't rebalance your portfolio ever. So if you're in your 20s, you're buying Coinbase companies, you're buying um, HelloFresh or uh, Beyond Meat. Boy, they're either going to make it or they're not. And if you keep selling the winners and buying the losers, you're going to end up with a bunch, you know, a bunch of losers because a bunch of these stocks are going to lose. So you know, just but, but can, could you handle that? What happens if you buy Beyond Meat and now it's 83% of your portfolio? Can you keep holding on to that? I don't know. You have to decide. If it's 7.3 billion, you have to probably sell some and get out. But you know, if it's $50,000, your portfolio is 50,000, you know, keep, keep going. I would say that. I'm probably the only professor at UTSA that would say that, right? Because that just sounds crazy, but uh, I would say rebalance. If, if you're managing, a portfolio for you know average investors you're gonna have you're gonna have to you have to limit 
the size of single hole. EMO, EMO plus. Oops. And in fact, you're required to report your top 10 holdings and what percentage they are in the portfolio. Um, and you have to be really, really careful when you get above 10% in the portfolio, there are rules where the SEC starts having concerns where your portfolio becomes a concentrated portfolio and you have to report it like that. So there are rules that you have to, that's why I hated mutual funds. There's all these rules. If you're a hedge fund, what do you do? Whatever you feel like. <laughs> right? There are no rules, so that's the advantage of being a hedge fund. If you want to have all your money in one stock, and you have qualified investors, and they know you have all your money in one stock, then yeah, you can do that. And it looks like ARC is pretty well diversified, isn't it? Isn't she? Where did we find her, her portfolio? Is that it? I think she has seven or eight different. There's one flagship, but seven or eight ones that are kind of like flagships. Does she show the percentage of each one? I guess you can. Oh, there's a way. Okay, so seven. Seven's not that much. So to me, a concentrated portfolio is like ten to twenty stocks. If you have ten stocks, you're going to have a stock over ten percent. If you have twenty stocks, obviously you're going to have stocks over five percent. So that's not that concentrated of a portfolio. For Tesla, boy, I'd be scared to death. That Tesla is my biggest holding, but boy, she must believe in. The second one looks like a pretty small company. Uh, yeah, twenty billion dollar company. Um, does she have any really really small companies? These are these are mid cap companies. I don't see anything that's there's Bean Therapeutics. Four billion. Yes, she's not. Yeah, I don't know where I just went, but um, she's not that concentrated. But you, you have to be careful. Most firms they don't want more than five percent to ten percent. Maybe ten. It depends. You know, not right now with Apple being five, six, seven percent of the market, it's it's kind of tough to have a limit. But uh, most most firms don't want more than 10% in one name just because if that firm crashes, it's just going to kill your performance. Because what are we looking at? Everybody's worried about relative performance. You have too, too much in one name and crash. Now, the market game that you are playing, market watch game, your strategy there is put all your money in the most levered one name you possibly can. Why? Because you're not trying to make money. You're trying to win a game. Their leverage in, in betting all in one name, like diversify, you're not going to win a diversified portfolio in that game. No, that's no way you're going to win. So then you're just overly, overly concentrated. So that game's not really real life. Uh, but these are the kind of things you have, to, you have to think about. But rebalancing is another thing you have to think about. Are you going to just let your names run? Are you going to have some rules? Now, the sales discipline, uh, I'll, I'll start here next. I want to talk about sales discipline. It's going to be a couple of weeks. Uh, but, but if you have, whoa. Someone got excited that I said that was done. Um, I will tell you, anytime I interviewed a manager and I asked for their sales discipline, they cleared their throat and they sat up straight because they knew I wanted a very serious answer. And here's when they started lying, like, oh, we're real disciplined. We always do this. Like, yeah, was, was, they don't. But I'll, I'll talk. The sales discipline is something you need to be real clear on. That you can articulate it very, very clearly because if you're wishy washy on that, and I'll give you some of the wishy washy answers I can tell they're just lying to me on that. All right, well, we'll start there. I'll let's out a little bit early. 